Hello, I'd like to call to order this regular board meeting or regular meeting of the school board of Forest Hills on 11 23 2020. Uh, roll call, Ms. Cropper. Mrs. Barber. Here. Ms. Joyce. Here. Dr. Rasmussen. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Dr. Heights. Here. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I have a, I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America, States of America. and to the Republic, Republic for which, for which it stands, stands. One, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. All right. Thank you. Um, Madam agenda. Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda. I make a motion to adopt the agenda. Can I get a second? Second. Ms. Cropper. Ms. Joyce. Yes. Mrs. Barber. Yes. Dr. Rasmussen. Yes. Mrs. Taylor. Yes. Dr. Heights. Yes. Item 3.1 uh, through 3.3, .3, approval of minutes of Technology and Facilities Committee, uh, Human Resources Committee, and the minutes of the regular meeting from October 26, 2020. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? I make a motion to approve the minutes, items 3.1 through 3.3. Can I get a second? Second. Any discussion, any corrections that need to be made? Hearing none, Ms. Cropper? Ms. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Barber? Yes. Dr. Rasmussen? Yes. Mrs. Taylor? Yes. Dr. Heights? Yes. Item 4.1, correspondence. Do we have any correspondence today? None. 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 Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, I need to go off mute. This comes to us uh, from Sh Sherry Hildebrandt. She's the Region 14 uh, consultant that works with our school district. And it is uh, Mr. Prebles and Dr. Heiss, board president. Congratulations to Forest Hills Local School District on being designated by your state support team as a recipient of the Ohio PBIS District Recognition Award for 2020. And so that everybody remembers that's positive behavior intervention supports that are happening in our schools. We look forward to celebrating this accomplishment with your team at the annual Ohio PBIS Showcase for 2020. The showcase will be on December 15, 2020, and we are joining efforts with the Ohio Leadership Advisory Council, that's OLAC, uh, for the event. The theme for the conference is leading and learning together. We look forward to celebrating with all of you who are implementing PBIS with fidelity to maintain a positive school culture and climate that benefits your entire school community. Congratulations again, and, and that comes from uh, Sherry Hildebrandt. And board members, we will acknowledge each Forest Hill School District building next month during our uh, regular in-person board meeting. Thank you. That is all of our correspondence. Forrest, we can't hear you. Did, did I mention they, you're on mute is annoying. There <laughs> 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 it is. Um, uh, thank you. We'll move on to uh, item 5.1, the cornerstone update. Mr. Sears. Yeah, thank you. And thank the Board of Education for allowing me the opportunity to share um, a brief update on the cornerstone work that we um, are um, in working through, through our teaching and learning team and through our teachers and administrators and buildings. Um, I just want to take a step back and um, talk a little bit about uh, our, the concept of our cornerstones um, ar arised about two years ago when we spent a significant amount of time talking with teachers and talking with administrators on new learning and how we drive new learning forward in our district. 
Um, we believe that um, having teachers at the forefront and having having teachers alongside the design and the creation of strategic initiatives are extremely important. And from there, we wanted to narrow the focus of the things that we were we were focusing on in our district. Those main strategic initiatives, we wanted to narrow the focus. So our goals of empowering teachers and narrowing our district focus really drove us to where we are with the corners, the cultural cornerstones in our district. Um, Adam, if you can go to the next slide, please. So with our cornerstones, this um, we have established, and this is uh, something we've worked through for the last year and a half significantly, um, the, basically the four pillars of our district, we call them cornerstones that we build on. Um, the first one is our culture of learning, our culture of relationships and wellness, a culture of collaboration, and a culture of innovation. These cornerstones are the foundation of new learning in our district for all of us. Um, and we strive to create personalized learning experiences. We're implementing relationships and wellness through our care work that we are doing. You'll hear a little bit more about in a second. Um, also with things like our Hope Squad as we focus on student and staff wellness. Our culture of collaboration where we um, have done a significant amount of work with implementing professional learning communities and collaborative teacher time throughout our district. And then also our culture of innovation which is having that innovative mindset um, as we um, navigate changing environments. So what I will say is this work that we started last year was led by teams of teachers for each one of these cornerstones. So we have four to six representatives from each building that are on these teams. We call them our cornerstone teams. We have cornerstone teams around each one of these. Um, and last year, there was a significant amount of work done throughout the year, pulling these folks together um, in training, educating, teaching, and then they would design and develop and implement new learning for each one of their buildings. Um, as a result of the work, and I, I wanna commend our staff and commend our teachers and administrators, the work that they've done has enabled us to be in the position where we are, especially when we look at our culture of innovation, in our culture of collaboration. When the COVID um, situation hit in the spring, our teachers leaned in on one another, they collaborated, they searched for new ways to meet kids' needs, they adapted their use of technology, and they did tremendous work um, navigating that spring experience and then have completely implemented a lot of that this fall as well as we continue to have face-to-face -face school um, for the majority of our students. So our culture of innovation and our culture of collaboration, although it might not have a specific strategic initiative this year because we've narrowed our focus even more because of the, the situation we're in, the innovative efforts of our teachers and the collaboration that happens on a weekly basis sets Forest Hills apart and it sets our teachers apart from other districts. Um, and we see that every single day. Um, and they need to be commended for the work they're doing and have done. And I kudos to the Cornerstone teams for kicking that off last year. Um, next slide, Adam. So our first strategic, and we'll go to the next one. We have created strategic initiatives for each one of our cornerstones. Um, these strategic initiatives guide the work for the year. The strategic initiatives were developed in collaboration with each cornerstone team last spring and early summer. So as school is happening differently and things are happening, we still had an eye on the future and a, and a focus on the future. And so the strategic initiatives kind of drive forward. This is our culture of learning. We created a definition of personalized learning last year. Now we're looking to implement the four, four elements of personalization for this year. Um, next slide, please. So our culture of personalized learning, although one adjustment we've had to make across the board is in the past, last year, we pulled our cornerstone teams together during the school day and spent, spent a significant amount of time in their own learning and then giving them time to develop and curate so that they could present and share and with the rest of the district and with their building. We have made a commitment this year because we have listened to the needs of our teachers and the needs of our staff. And I think you'll hear in a little while how that's benefiting us is and even some of the challenges that we have. We are not pulling staff this year for um, professional learning opportunities. 
We are doing that because um, we want to maintain the available subs that we have. And so we did not feel that it was prudent to pull our cornerstone teams to have new learning going on when we are struggling to find substitute teachers on a daily basis anyway. So that was a decision that was made early on in the summer that we did not feel like we should be pulling our teachers. So therefore, we wanted to pivot. So we are, the focus of our district is personalizing instruction for kids. We're seeing that play out every single day with students that are in our face-to-face -face settings, students that are in virtual settings, and students that are quarantined. We're, our teachers are doing amazing work trying to do the things necessary to personalize that instruction and meet individual kids' needs, oftentimes going above and beyond um, what is the, the allotted or required time even to meet their needs. Um, so how we are moving this strategic initiative forward this year is, um, and our teachers know that on Mondays, our teaching and learning team does learning walks, that we are out in the buildings. This year, we are adding other administrators from other districts or other buildings. We're all coming together to learn from one another, to be able to spot personalized learning in classrooms and so that we can give teachers incredibly positive feedback about things that are happening. Um, we are also have spending a significant amount of time focusing on leadership competencies with our, with our principals. So we want them to be personalized, innovative leaders. And so we are spending a lot of time with them this year uh, because we can pull them together for some, some new learning that we're working to grow their ability to lead um, in innovate and personalize instruction. And our LDSs are doing a significant amount of coaching. They have created a coaching model that aligns to the elements of personalization, that they are working individually, um, coaching um, individual teachers on some, uh, some growth. They're piloting that model this year with some of our newer teachers, um, and they're providing significant amount of support. So although we may not be pulling our cornerstone team together, we are still focusing on this, this effort of personalization, um, and we are seeing pl that played out, out as well. The last thing I'll say about personalized learning is it is not just student learning, but it's staff learning. So we have this year, um, at the beginning of the year, we put our PD days at the beginning of the year, and we gave our teachers a significant amount of time for them to personalize their own learning for where they are for the, to start the school year. Um, and we saw great benefits of teachers using that time for, for areas that they needed to. We've all sat in different personal, with different experiences where um, everybody's learning about the same thing, but some of our teachers needed various other components to help in their own, their own um, instructional practices. So they were able to personalize their PD um, on the PD days that we have had. So that's been beneficial. Um, the next one is I will talk about our culture of relationships and wellness. We have two cornerstone teams here. We have a care team that has been in existence for um, three or four years now. And then we have a, new, um, a team that is starting work this year on wellness. And so we have um, our care team is focusing on a sense of belonging as we're striving for inclusion and equity in our district. And then our wellness team is we're trying to get a systematic approach for tier one in, um, instructional practices um, throughout our district. So that's one of the focus that we've created anchors that is a big project that's going to take many years for us to, to align on, um, and, and we're starting some of that work. Next slide, please. So in our cultural relationships and wellness, one of the things that we are continuing is our relationship with Catrice Cate. Um, Catrice is a, a consultant with Hamilton County ESC. Um, she is leading our teachers and our staff and administrative teams through work around her one-degree shift model. This year's focus is on a sense of belonging. Uh, we've had Catrice in our district for a full day where she met face-to-face -face and virtually with some of our teams at each building, and um, she will continue that. She's created some small segments of, of virtual video experiences that we're gonna be rolling out in the coming weeks to our, to our staff to begin to, to engage into some of that work. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things, just this is the framework that we're working on in Forest Hills for um, our movement towards inclusion and equity. So it is a framework, it is a continuum that's diversity, belonging, inclusion, and equity. Right now we are in the belonging as we are developing that ongoing culture 
that have people feel welcome across our district. So our sense of belonging is this strategic initiative this year. And over the course of the coming years, we will we will continue to advance down that continuum. Next slide, please. Um, and our culture of relationships and wellness is our wellness committee. Um, this team is um, meeting regularly. It contains a lot of different folks throughout our district, administrators, some of our psychologists, our counselors, and some of our central office team as well. Um, and they're meeting regularly as we um, they move some of that forward. So throughout this year, um, the focus of our work was how do we return kids to school? So this team focused a lot on, we had students that were living in this virtual isolated world that now we were gonna integrate back into the school setting where they're experiencing a lot of different, um, a lot of different emotions based on that. Um, so the focus of this team was to support our kids to navigate back into school, which was a traumatic event for some students based on their, um, their own personal experiences. And, and our, I wanna commend our counselors, psychologists, administrators, and teachers for doing significant work, um, getting our kids back into school safely. Um, we have supported our students through PBIS. Hope Squad's launched recently, um, and we're, we've reintegrated our child focus and our school-based therapy um, with our child focus groups. Um, second semester, this team will, will be focusing on um, this, uh, this, they will be focusing on the restructuring, more continuing the wellness work. Um, and we, were, we are really focusing on a screener for our students so that we can have um, where we can um, determine at-risk students at a quicker rate. Um, rather than an emotional event happen, we wanna be able to deliver a screener that will, that will put kids on our radar so that we can meet with them individually and start to, um, start to work with individual kids. So that is a focus of the Wellness Committee. Um, next slide, please. So our last two, which I already talked about, was the culture of collaboration and culture of innovation. These are, we've done significant work around this. There is not new learning that exists this year around collaboration and innovation. These are the mindsets, these are the PLCs, these are things we've established that are enabling four skills to be successful, enabling our teachers to, um, to be able to meet the changing dynamics and demands of the current realities of instruction. Um, we're proud of the work that is happening, although it looks different this year than it has last year. We're excited about the future and we're excited about reintegrating these cornerstone teams back together um, as we navigate through the second semester in the, in the spring and putting them together at periods of time so that when, um, when we have an opportunity to get back to full face-to-face -face collaboration, um, we're excited about that. So. Um, I want to, I'll take any questions. I want to thank um, everyone for um, allowing me to just um, brag about where wh the things that are going on in district. Super proud of this work um, and love that our, our staff and our teachers are at the forefront of leading each other through each one of these cornerstones. So um, thanks. And if I'll take questions if anybody has any. Um, I just want to say, so I got a smile on my face when we hit this last slide with collaboration and innovation because everyone wondered how Forest Hills was able to pivot so quickly and come up with a system that allowed us to stay face to face and also virtual. This is why, because you proactively set up your systems so that there was a framework and, and we're just working them. So kudos to everybody because not that you could have foreseen what was gonna happen this year, but the foresight to put this particular system in place is actually what held the ship up. <laughs> it's pretty great. Also, um, let me just share that I had the opportunity to visit several schools and I saw students at every level working, learning, they stayed focused. I was able to speak with administrators, custodians, cafeteria workers, uh, you name it. And they were all just working hard. They were working hard despite or in spite of having to do extra duty. They, <clears throat> they had smiles on their faces. Um, the office staff, I mean, they, they're phenomenal. I mean, they're just doing such an outstanding job to keep our schools open for our children. So good job. 
uh, Greg, I have a question. Um, with with this whole structure that we have, you know that what we I'm sure we have learned since August, so we started back in school to now we've gained a lot of um, experience. You know what I mean about COVID and and how to keep everybody safe, the teachers, the the students. You know we're exploding right now with quarantining cases and of course COVID. What have we done there? What have we learned? And what have we been able to implement to help keep everyone um, safer and kind of um, help with the quarantining and of course catching anything? Yeah, so I, I think from an instructional standpoint, we have, um, I would say that what has benefited our district is when our teachers have had the experience um, of being notified that X number of kids in their class are now under quarantine, they have, have a mindset to problem solve and they have a mindset to, okay, how, all right, what do I need to do? How do I meet these individual students needs? Because they spend a lot of time at the beginning of the year getting to know and throughout the year getting to know all of their students on an individual level, understanding their needs, their skills and abilities and interests. And so they're able to connect and that's part of that personalized experience is that our teachers get to know our kids so that when they're faced with a quarantine situation, they know what the individual students need and they're able to make that, that, that it's, and it's that in of that mindset for change. Um, and so part of the work around innovation that we've done is although it's not um, an innovative product necessarily, if you look at the shadow behind that, that cornerstone, it's at a mindset. So we have a mindset for and, and worked a lot on last year, our mindset for um, how to change or experience or problem solve things differently. We did not anticipate having to put any of this in action, especially to the level that we, they, the teachers had to. Um, and, and truthfully, I think that's, that's a lot of that, that um, the instructional piece that we have been able to keep our kids connected to our teachers, keep our kids connected to the content, connected to the curriculum, um, and and I, I think that's benefited our kids. It's, it looks different in other places, and we're really proud of the work our teachers have done around them. So I mean, I'm answering your question, Mrs. Taylor, from an instructional standpoint, um, that we have been able to deal with the changing and all of the parameters and the rules and the guidance that we are, have to follow, that we're able to adapt quickly to meet the needs of individual kids. From a physical standpoint, we do have uh, Mike Broadwater and John Eckert who visit the buildings uh, often, uh, specifically John Eckert. We talk with our teachers, we talk with our principals to increase our mitigation uh, plans that we have in place. Uh, just last week, uh, I know we had a conversation at the board level at the, um, re not the retreat, but the uh, work session at the board where we talked about reminding principals and working with staff to maintain that six feet of different distance because we, we are really uh, dealing with some quarantine issues uh, and things like that. So we're trying to remind people of the distances. We're trying to remind people of the masks and all of those types of things That's because we want to keep our staff healthy. Uh, like in other places, there is fatigue with some of this. So we just try to uh, provide people with the information that, that the system is working from a health perspective, and we'll show you some data here in a few minutes that hopefully will show that. Um, but our teachers are uh, have a big voice, and we meet in our offices often with Donna Lauber, who is the association president, and she provides us with feedback from the teachers so that we can go to places uh, remotely and make sure that we are administratively and operationally doing the things that we can to keep the environment as safe as possible in real time. So that's a great question because fatigue is setting in in a lot of places. If, if I were to uh, just add to everything Scott has said, Ms. Taylor, you have, uh, if you look at the staff members who have quarantined, um, there have been few that have been generated out of the classroom. A lot of our staff members that have had to quarantine or tested positive is from outside. And so I think our staff in the classrooms have done a very, very good job of making sure they maintain the six feet. Uh, but um, when it comes from the outside, that's that's difficult to, you know, it's difficult to prepare for and, and uh, avoid.
My final thought, uh, if I may, uh, Dr. Heist and um, fellow board members, is that what our teachers have been able to accomplish uh, and coordinate with principals and the teaching and learning uh, department uh, to ensure that we have uh, instruction that is robust, that is meaningful, that is interactive, that is engaging, has been phenomenal. Um, Mike will show you, I think, in a little bit that we're all constantly watching the attendance, not to see you know, who's showing up or not showing up uh, in that sense, but what we're finding is that absence of COVID, if you take a look at our um, attendance rate of our staff, it is higher this year than what you may see in past years. Um, I think that our teachers are taking all of this very seriously. They are extremely vigilant. Uh, they want students in classrooms. They want face-to-face -face instruction. They're doing everything they possibly can. And, um, and we're still receiving the PBIS awards. We're still seeing kids doing quite well on, on assessments and things like that. And so our teachers and our staff that are supportive of the teachers and the students, they're all doing a great job. And uh, I appreciate that. And I know the board does. Um, and we just need to, to thank them because it's, it's been a long haul and they're doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, we'll move on to item 5.2, superintendent updates. Mr. Prebles. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Heist, board members, uh, community members who are listening in. What we're going to go through at this particular point in time is our plans for uh, second semester return to learn. And so, um, Adam, I, I can't see the slide. Uh, but the first slide says first semester review. Are we there? There it is. Uh, well, let me see. We're looking for the power or the uh, presentation. For those of you looking in, it worked in rehearsal. So we're, uh, we'll be with you in a second. A little technological adjusting here. That's us. Good, good job. So board members, can you hear me? Thumbs up just so I know that. OK. All right. So uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, and so we'll talk now about the uh, plans for second semester. And before we do that, I would like everyone to know that I am greatly appreciative of the fact that our Board of Education created a work session. I can tell you that it's, it's almost a daily conversation with our board president and myself, uh, and then the coordination that happens between Dr. Heiss and the rest of the board members and the individual telephone calls that our board members have had with me uh, to give me feedback. Uh, certainly, uh, no decisions are made outside of a forum like this, but the feedback and the participation by our board members is greatly appreciated because uh, that's important when we're making something that is this significant 
uh, available to students and the impact that it has not only on our students, but our staff and our parents and community. So uh, thank you, board members, for your engagement in this process. And uh, so we'll get going now to, to try to save some time. But the first slide here talks about first semester review. Before we talk about, Adam, if you can switch that, before we talk about uh, where we're going in second semester, we really wanted to help folks understand that there's been a lot of uh, information and data that we have reviewed over the first semester uh, to try to plan uh, for second semester. Um, it's very difficult in this environment to be able to make projections from the future other, in the future other than we know that it changes very rapidly given uh, the, uh, the comprehensiveness of this disease and COVID-19 in our, in our world right now. Uh, so we want to talk to you a little bit about what we've learned about student attendance related to COVID and the, some of the things that we're thinking about in second semester that will hopefully be helpful for our students and our, our families. I want to talk to you about staff attendance and how COVID has impacted uh, our staff and, and basically the health of our staff is a paramount concern as we go into second semester. And I've talked to four superintendents today in other districts that are dealing with very similar situations that we've been dealing with. And um, we're all sort of white knuckled. We're a little concerned, but at this particular time, Forest Hills, I think Elizabeth said it, we have structures in place and we're trying to navigate with flexibility and communication with our parents as quickly as we can. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the, the quarantines that we're dealing with, what's happening inside of our facilities, as well as what we're learning about the impacts of the many things and the many activities that folks are involved in outside of our uh, schools and in their daily activities in life and how that is impacting our schools. And so the fourth bullet or the fourth uh, thing there is the implications of all that. So I wanna go back, if you will bear with me for a few minutes. You know, when this all started and this is updated in July uh, 26, 2020, when all of this started, we were, as a school district and, and basically as a community, state, and country for that matter, learning about COVID. We were learning about reproductive rates and impact on students. We were working with CDC regulations, state regulations, the American Academy of Pediatrics, all the recommendations uh, and guidelines from all of these organizations. We have never been as coordinated, and I am so thankful for Hamilton County <clears throat> health officials and those offices. We've never been as coordinated, not only with Hamilton County, but also our local uh, Anderson Township <clears throat> administration on decisions, <clears throat> excuse me, decisions that we're making. We've looked at numbers of ICU, and back in March and April, according to our local doctors, the ICU mortality rate was 20%. It is down now to 11%. <clears throat> uh, and, and, you know, 11% is, is not good, but it's significantly better. So we've learned about um, medication and how we can mitigate and how we can provide better care for people. We've learned about those that are hospitalized. We've learned about um, the governor's health assessment chart and the colors across the state and how that impacts or is supposed to impact local communities. Uh, we, Greg talked a little bit about our virtual academy, the ability to be able to provide technology to families across the school district and make sure that they had not only access uh, via the internet, but actually have the equipment in their homes. We had a big, big discussion for many, many weeks about special education students and our need to be able to serve them at a high quality level and make sure that we're bringing those children along just as we are all of our students, students in the school district. And so back in that time, we were also looking at numbers from a very global sense. And so this is where we started in July with taking a look at the state and the county and our attendance areas and, and what those numbers looked like. And so back when we started in our infancy, uh, a lot less literate about all of this as we are today, um, we made a decision at that time. The Board of Education uh, was a front runner in the area, and they made the decision that we have things in place and we're going to use a face-to-face -face model. Uh, and so that's what we did and we offered a virtual academy. So if we'll switch to the second slide, well, you can see right there that at that time, we looked very, very good when you took a look at COVID with the things we knew at that time. The second slide then takes us into a little bit later and we were into October. Now we're beginning to see that cases are increasing 
uh, not only at the state level, but at Hamilton County and in our attendance area. Uh, and so we actually added a little bit to our data because we needed to get a little bit more granular. That, that 0.61 in our attendance area was uh, worrisome for us, and we needed to reflect a little bit more on what's actually taking place within our schools. And so then when we took a look at our population of 8,100 students and staff that participate each day in um, face-to-face instruction, this does not include our virtual academy students or staff. These are the, the children and the staff that come in on a daily basis from bus drivers, cafeteria, everybody, uh, office personnel. And so now you can see that we were in a place with 16 cases back in October, back down at 0.19%. And we thought at that particular time, and still do believe that the mitigation things that we had in place and the things that we were doing were uh, serving us quite well. And remember, that is then in uh, October. The other thing I would like to remind folks is this is still cumulative data. What I mean by that is this is not necessarily real time. As we learned more about isolation and quarantine, what we then had to take a look at is active cases. What's happening in our district at the moment? Because if we continue to collect cumulative data, let's go to the next slide. Uh, you can see that the numbers ramp up significantly. So we continue to count from day one all the way through November 23rd, the number of cases in our schools. But remember that when you take a look at the 137 confirmed cases in our school district, that that is nowhere near the number of active cases. And, and um, people talk about viral infections and all those. And again, I'm not an epidemiologist, but we do need to kind of have a sense of the real circumstance in a school building to be able to make decisions that impact a lot of people, but we want face-to-face -face instruction in our schools. We believe in that. Our, and obviously we've seen from Greg's presentation, we've got phenomenal teachers, phenomenal support staff, and we believe we do good work. And our students and our parents are linked in and because of that, we performed pretty well. Um, we started to then get a closer look at this and because of what we were beginning to see in the confirmed cases, we needed to make some decisions and the Board of Education leaned in and provided authorization for its administration to be able to make remote decisions, more location specific decisions. And Last week, I talked about a uh, grade level at Wilson uh, that needed to go to remote. And just this past Thursday, excuse me, yes, this past Thursday and Friday, Turpin High School needed to go to remote because of a situation that was happening at the location. So if we go to the next slide, again, we're still collecting cumulative. Let's take a look now at our active cases in our school district and also the active cases in the state. So I am not a professional epidemiologist nor a statistician, uh, but I, I understand about uh, quarantine time and I understand about isolation time. So the active cases in the state by Scott Prebles' map, going back 14 days, 10 days, excuse me, 10 days, you can see that the active cases in the state of Ohio right now are at, are at 0.17. The active cases in Hamilton County are 0.54. Uh, in our zip code, they're 0.42. But if you take a look in our school system, we're 0.49. Active cases, there are 40 students and staff collectively in our schools right now that have, that are, um, that, that have COVID-19 confirmed cases. This is updated today, November 23rd. If we go to the next slide now, what does that mean a little bit even more granular? And this is what Mike's gonna talk about in a few minutes and, and I'll get to that red 1.25. But now if you take a look at the population, there are 40 active cases in our school system that puts us at a 0.49. There are approximately 7,300 students that show up every day the active cases of students is 30, so they drop down to 0.41. Mike will talk about the quarantine, but you can see that 323 students are quarantined right now. That is a significant issue for 
issue for all schools dealing with COVID. And of those 323, and this has been a question in our community, many people have said, you're not reporting all of them. And anyone who has asked that question or has made that point is absolutely correct. We are obligated and required to, you, to work with Hamilton County to do our contact tracing in coordination with individuals who are entering or we are aware of inside of our building. This 323 does not include people who are self-quarantined that we don't even know about. This is what we have in our schools right now. And so the number is higher and that influences the work and the way that teachers work. And that's something that we will fold into our second semester planning. If you look at the staff, this is very, very concerning to me. It is very concerning to our Board of Education. And it is, it is why we're gonna make some recommendations that we do. If you look at our staff of the 800 individuals that we employ, approximately 800 who come into our buildings every single day or engage with students in some way in our face-to-face -face model, that number greatly exceeds what you see. Uh, that greatly is my term. It's about three times what you see with our students. Now, that seems very high, so I wanted to break that down a little bit more because last um, Wednesday, we had a situation at Turpin High School where we had a, a cafeteria workers and, and because we were quarantining inside, we had all of our cafeteria workers uh, quarantine. And so that 1.25% is, is elevated right now, but it is isolated again. It's, it's isolated in this particular case somewhat to a specific building and the board in its foresight uh, gave us authorization to be able to remotely make decisions about that. So we took care of the students and the staff at Turpin High School, closed that building for a couple of days, readjusted through Mr. Broadwater's office and Tia, our, uh, Tia Strauss, our food service director. We've reestablished staffing. And so we're back online Monday and Tuesday of this week for face-to-face -face instruction. So if you subtract those cases out, we have active cases in our school district right now, 38, and that means we are 0.46, which is below what you would see at the state level. And I'm sorry that that got taken off there, but right now we're, we're still in a, in a place, um, none are good, but that number is pretty good. And it's, it's getting more granular, and I know it's a lot of information for folks, but people will say to us all the time, What's the trigger? How will you make decisions about a full remote or a full district decision about education? We are trying to maintain face-to-face, -face, be flexible and adaptable to remote locations, make adjustments as needed, adjust our staff, keep our staff as safe as possible along with our students and keep this thing moving forward. Next slide, please. This is a slide then that um, as we worked with our community, and I'm gonna let Mike take over from this point forward, um, we changed our website based on comments that our community and parents has at, had asked us. They wanted to know more specifically what's happening in each building. So we've updated the way that we um, uh, provide this information to our community. You can find this on the district's website if you link on there. And also you can find additional data that's linked to this chart that gives you more specific information that you may have questions about. So what does all this mean for us as a school district? And that's where Mike's gonna take over and talk a little bit about how he's been dealing with and the numbers that we chart and graph and watch as we uh, progress and, and develop our plan for second semester. Okay, uh, I'll hop in and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna look through the lens of the individual who oversees human resources. Our ultimate number one goal is to make sure we keep kids safe and, and we understand that. Uh, but I'm gonna take a look at with our staff, when we look at, do we, uh, do we have to take a pause like we did at Turpin? It, it's normally gonna be because of staffing and things that are going on there. We look at that every day. So. When you look at the chart and this chart I pulled off today off our website, 
I would direct you to just as an example, if you go to Turpin and you look at Turpin, you have three staff members that tested positive that are new cases uh, on last week. You had eight students. Those three staff members that were positive uh, obviously need substitute teachers. And we do have building permanent building substitute teachers to take care of a lot of the absences. And uh, we did that at the beginning of the year. Uh, board, you'll remember in August, we said our biggest concern probably wasn't going to be uh, student absences. It was going to be staff absences. And more specifically, it's the quarantine aspect of all of this that, that is difficult. So when you look at Turpin, you have three positive staff, eight positive students. You have six staff that have been quarantined last week, and you have 89 students that were quarantined. And a couple of caveats to that is we did not have school at Turpin Thursday and Friday, so those numbers are skewed a little bit. But also the students, what we're finding is um, if, it, if it occurs with staff members, we were able to set up an identif identification code on our attendance reporting system such that I'll, I'll know who's out due to COVID for the staff. The students that are positive will know because the Hamilton County Board of Health will let us know. And John Eckert uh, has done a fantastic job building that relationship. The students that sometimes kind of fall through the cracks are the ones that maybe are quarantining on their own. Uh, were not necessarily reported to Hamilton County. And so these are the data points that we know of. And uh, could, could things be different because of quarantining outside? Absolutely, but we think we're pretty solid. So the point being is if you look at Turpin last week, you can see where we were getting pretty close where we had to make some decisions because we had staff absences due to COVID at nine. You also have regular staff absences. So that's when it starts to get a little bit more difficult. If you look at the bold statement underneath, the staff absence due to COVID-19 was 199 last week. What that means is if a teacher is quarantined on Monday, they're going to miss five days. So that's five days of absence. So 199 days uh, really of absences with staff is what we had last week. And that, that's the number that I worry about in human resources is um, being able to find substitutes for those positions. Some positions you don't need to find substitutes, some you do. But the point with this chart is you can see at Turpin and Anderson, those were the two that we were really monitoring, just, just like we monitor them all, but Turpin and Anderson were our concerns last week. Adam, go ahead and hit the next slide. With Turpin and Anderson, I thought I would throw up a chart here so you could see where we are, and as Mrs. Taylor had said, you can see that we are kind of ticking upwards just like society is, and the numbers are growing. Uh, if you look at Turpin High School for November, I would point out if we, if we grab a date, say November 12th, where you have four new positive COVIDs, you have 122 actively quarantined for the students, you had 12 staff that were absent, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the, uh, we're looking at 422, you had 16 staff absent, nine were uncovered. And so when you reach a number of nine teachers that are uncovered during the day at the high school level, most teachers have five periods, if not six, but if we say five periods, that means you've got 45 periods that are uncovered. And those are the numbers in the human resource department that we look at. And you can see Anderson and Turpin those numbers were, were creeping up, and that's a concern. And obviously, I will hear from Rob Fellows or Dave Spencer in the morning if there's issues with covering uh, the teachers, and we keep an eye on that. But that's, that's one of the, the data points that we take a look at. Adam, go ahead and hit the next one. Okay, the next one, we did review this in the work session that we had, but I think it's important to reiterate for everybody that may be watching these are the staff absences from the first day of school, August 17th, until November 13th is when I stopped doing the data. I didn't have last week in it. So November 13th, we had 840 total absences due to COVID. That's whether they're positive or quarantined. We needed subs for 554 of those positions, and that's normally your teaching positions. If it's an administrator, uh, they may be working from home or, or we may not need subs for other individuals. But if you notice, 
the filled, we were at about 370 positions were filled. That's the green bar graph. The yellow is unfilled. So if we're at 370, we'd be at about 180, 184 for unfilled. And so when you're at a 70% fill rate, it's getting very, very difficult. And what it does is it starts taxing our regular teaching staff because we are starting to ask them to substitute teach in their plan period. So not only are they delivering instruction virtually, face-to-face, -face, they have to plan for that, and now they're losing their planning period. And Scott mentioned teacher fatigue, and uh, it, it, it is real because we're asking the teachers to do a lot more in regards to the classroom and then also substitute teaching. Go ahead, next slide, Adam. And uh, I just want to kind of hone down a little bit closer. November 9th is a day I just picked. Uh, and that was uh, looking at just the staff absences due to COVID. You can see we had 48 staff absences. We needed subs for 31 of those positions, so probably, again, 31 teachers. You can see we filled uh, 17, which means we unfilled 14. And when you're starting to look at your about 55% fill rate, that's when we know that we've got some issues. So November 9th. We were looking, and that's when we start to look at each individual building and see where do we have some, some things that we need to be concerned about. So that's just the daily fill rate that I look at every day and see where we are as a district and as a building. And then the next slide, what this is, if you recall, we went remote at Wilson Elementary a, few, a couple weeks back. The reason is when we get on and we look at the staff absences, we had a total of 18 staff absences at Wilson. We had, if you look at the chart there, we had six that were filled, nine that were unfilled, and uh, that's a pretty good indication that we've got a problem, that we're not gonna be able to find substitute teachers. And I know there was one local district that has uh, canceled classes due to the lack of finding substitute teachers. We have been very, very blessed to have the substitute teachers that we have. I know that Hamilton County Sub Solutions emailed me a couple days ago and said they had about eight to 10 more uh, individuals interested in substituting the Forest Hill School District, which is great. Uh, and that was by word of mouth. And so we are trying to add substitute teachers as we go as, the, as COVID starts to tick up. But this slide's just a perfect example of why a building may have to go remote, is, and it's due to staffing, not necessarily students. Next slide. The, uh, the biggest thing I wanted to kind of throw on here was what have we learned? When we look at first semester, we knew at the beginning of this school year substitute teaching was going to be an issue. Uh, we knew we had to develop a virtual academy. Greg and his uh, group did a fantastic job of developing that. Uh, Donna Lauber and the Teachers Association was very, very uh, cooperative in the memorandum of understanding that we developed. We knew that substitute teaching was going to be difficult. I don't think we anticipated the amount of movement we would see uh, of kids quarantining back and forth. And so what's happened, the first item I put, what, what we've learned, teacher fatigue due to lack of substitute teachers and varying instructional models is evident, and it, it is a current concern. We can say, hey, just battle through it but we're asking our teachers to do a lot more. And uh, it, it's becoming a concern with the teacher fatigue. I will echo what Scott said, which is the data that I have pulled shows that if we were to eliminate all of the absences due to COVID, we would be down about a thousand absences from this point last year, which means our staff has just done a fantastic job of showing up for each other and showing up for the kids and uh, I am extremely pleased. I think we're very blessed to have the professional teaching staff and classified staff that we have working with our kids. The second item, and then I'll stop there, is I think it's important to anticipate, number one, our goal is to stay face-to-face. -face. We know that's the best for our kids, and that's what we want to do. What we need to do is anticipate where issues are going to arise and try and, try and address them at each individual building. That's what you saw us do at Wilson. That's what you saw us do at Turpin. And so every morning we are constantly looking at where we may have some issues. And uh, we know that if we are asking our teachers to substitute a lot because substitute teachers are hard to find, 
we're taking away a lot of their planning time, and, and that's an issue with our staff uh, as we move forward. So with that, Scott, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Thank you, Mike. I, I talked to John Eckert earlier today to confirm what I'm about to say. We've had some quarantines uh, that we obviously that we have implemented in our buildings, but we know to date of no case in our schools where COVID-19 passed from one person to another. We are unaware um, of a case in our schools where a sick person transmitted it to another person within our school system. We have quarantine. I want to make sure that I'm being you know, accurate here. But that to me says, as we have said from the very beginning, schools apparently are among the safest places because of the mitigation things that we are doing, the masks that we wear, the distances that we try to maintain. And there are times when people, you know, it, it, it's not perfect, but by and large, we're doing a very, very good job of mitigation within our schools. And I think that we're seeing the benefits of that because we never believed uh, in September that we would be talking about finalizing first semester face-to-face -face just based on what we were dealing with back then and what we thought. So as we think about second semester, we wanted to uh, uh, make sure, and we had contacted, and for the last about month and a half, we've had our principals working with um, parents to do parent, you know, talking about parent requests in second semester, making sure that those individuals who would like their children to go virtual or who would like them to go face to face could make those switches. Talked to Greg Sears many times. He's reviewed this with the staff, with the directors we have. We think right now we are we are capable. There's a couple of hot spots, but we are capable of being able to provide the same type of face to face and the same virtual academy opportunities for our students. And um, so. As far as staffing is concerned, we think we are capable of doing that. Parent requests, we believe we have made all of those and the adjustments are taking place. And we are also very, very conscientious about, as you have heard throughout this conversation, the health of our staff in our second semester planning. We're beginning to see that there is an increasing uh, level of activity in cases and quarantines at our elementary level. And because of that, we've needed to take a closer look at what we're planning on for second semester and how we might be able to, uh, you know, navigate away from our youngest learners uh, having COVID and having something become a community spread within our schools. Uh, we are definitely interested in that outside quarantine impact. And certainly there's no need for me to uh, try to tell anyone what to do outside in their personal life, but I can tell you that some of the things that have taken place in the outside world uh, have influenced us uh, dramatically. And so we need to be prepared for that and build in our plan uh, in the second semester. I, I think that, uh, you know, life exists and uh, we need to be prepared for that. We're hoping that people are making the right choices. We're hoping that they're not congregating, that they're wearing masks and they're doing the distancing, but the reality and the numbers today, uh, 11,000, almost 12,000 people in the state of Ohio, I think the spread is ahead of us, uh, and I think that we need to be thinking about that when we consider second semester. The increased demands on our teaching staff with the quarantines, with what Mr. Broadwater had talked about, the, just the, the uh, the, the typical face-to-face -face and the remote now that is becoming more and more prevalent in our elementary as well as our middle and high schools because of the quarantining, the virtual academy and the streaming that's taking place, the coverage of additional courses throughout the, or classes throughout the day that teachers are doing to try to help. These are all things that are becoming management issues for our staff and they're going to need in the second semester all of our support to be able to get them and our students through second semester. So that's part of our plan. We also need needed to be consistent with what we are recommending for second semester. And when we talk about consistency, that's about parents. That's about families. That's about doing things and communicating things in advance with balance in there. We recognize that uh, individuals need to work. There are personal responsibilities, professional responsibilities. We also have a responsibility to be considerate of 
the fact that we have many people who have children in our school system who are hospital first responders, emergency folks out there that are working in hospitals. And we need to balance our needs with the needs of our community as well. And we're hoping that people will notice that in the things that we have planned for second semester. Next slide, please. So these are the things that are the key components to our recommendations for the second semester. Uh, we are going to recommend that we maintain our half-day kindergarten program into the second semester. We know that that um, has been able to be dealt with and families have made those adjustments. Uh, this district wants all day, every day kindergarten at this particular point in time, based on what we know, we're gonna maintain the half-day uh, kindergarten program. We are gonna continue with a very robust and teacher-led, Forest Hills teacher-led virtual academy uh, what, that our students will be uh, participating in. And as I said before, we believe we have all of those uh, scheduled and ready to go. We want to have a face-to-face. -face. That is our primary objective to maintain that face-to-face -face for all the reasons we are all aware. But we want to add a remote hybrid component to that, an actual remote learning option uh, each week. Um, in that uh, plan, uh, we would have... Uh, thinking about our students, a nine through 12 extracurricular and performance-based self-quarantine option. The quarantine has been a difficult thing for kids who are performing, for kids who are participating in extracurriculars. And so we have modeled what we see in some area, uh, area school districts. And uh, this uh, will be an opportunity, and this will be shared with parents and students tomorrow, that those individuals um, who want to do that, there are, rec there are requirements and um, things that you would need to do and talk with your athletic directors, your uh, sponsors of your programs and principals to ensure that uh, self-quarantine option that we have available uh, is being utilized um, appropriately. Uh, we also uh, would be having a Wednesday remote learning day. Uh, and that is where Greg Sears is going to take over the conversation now uh, regarding key components for the second semester because we want to talk about what that looks like and what that would mean for students, for staff, and for our families. Greg. Yep, thanks, Scott. Um, so the proposal in what we're um, wanting to implement for the Wednesday remote learning starting January 13th and then operating every Wednesday to up to spring break, we would want to participate in a remote learning experience for um, pre-K through 12 for the entire district. Um, so that would be a, a, an opportunity where students would learn and work from home remotely. Um, and in a lot of this, um, the rationale behind this goes into what Mike was talking about just a few minutes ago um, and what Scott was mentioning as well, just with the, um, with the amount of additional work additional quarantines and um, connecting with kids and teachers subbing for one another during, um, during each week. Um, it, it gets challenging, it's difficult, and that's where the fatigue comes in. Um, I wanna just reiterate that our entire purpose and our entire goal is to have school face-to-face -face as much as possible. Um, parents who have chosen the virtual academy have chosen that as their primary option, and we've worked hard to make that a, a, a robust experience. Uh, but for the majority of our students, our desire is to be face-to-face. -face. And we've had to make some adjustments to our schooling experience in various places. Um, and we feel like adding in the Wednesday remote learning experience will give us the best chance and the best success for our teachers to be able to meet individual kids' needs throughout the entire second semester or up until spring break at this point. Um, so a lot of that rationale is, is based on um, that uh, giving our teachers the time necessary so that they can connect with kids. They can collaborate. We talked about earlier the culture of collaboration in our teachers meeting at PLC. They're having a difficult time doing that when they are consistently working to sub for one another. And, or if they have a large amount of students that are on quarantine, those kids are having individual emails, individual questions, individual connections that they have to make. We need to provide the teachers the time necessary to meet all of our kids' needs. Um, so that would be January 13th through, the sp through spring break. 
our students on that day, on those days, would work um, on relatively independent learning opportunities. So our teachers would post assignments um, in um, using the platforms that they currently do, such as Schoology for the majority of our grade levels, or they would send home um, the uh, material or books or um, continue the learning opportunities that they had from the previous days. They would send that home with kids for them to complete and work through um, with the expectation that that returns um, when they come back the next day. Our staff does have, and our teachers will have the opportunity if they want to connect virtually with classes and they want to run a virtual class that day or that week, they certainly can do that. Students will be expected to join in through their Google Meet session um, and they can connect with kids uh, and connect with the class. So if the teacher has something robust going on that week where they have to continue to meet and direct to instruct, they can set that up. Kids can, um, can do that. That will be an option for teachers as well. Um, it's it'll also give our teachers the opportunity if they need to connect with kids for remediation, intervention, or enrichment, they will have the opportunity for that on those days as well. Um, but the majority of the time will be for our staff to be able to adequately prepare themselves and collaborate and be um, being able to meet the individual needs of kids based on the consistent changing virtual quarantine face-to-face -face dynamics that they're faced with on a daily basis um, in we will in part of this presentation that will also be updated on the website we will have an updated calendar um, that we will put if, um, if if the board approves this we will have a calendar that we will update and put up um, um, and this adjustment will be put up as soon as um, as soon as it's available um, which would be probably within the next day we would have that available um, but all of this gives us the ability to make these flexible remote decision making and such as um, our primary focus is to be able to respond where we need to respond and make some adjustments like we've done at Wilson for our sixth grade, like we did the last couple of days at Turpin. Um, we our, our main approach is we want to deal with this, the situations and the problems where they are and make adjustments. And so we will there may be opportunity or need for us to go to a flexible short-term remote model based on the whatever the dynamics that take place or the the challenges that certain buildings are happening um primarily with staff as mike noted um it is that is our, our it's a major challenge for us to in some cases to have staff um of uh, the appropriate amount of staff each day and then we have to make adjustments accordingly um, Adam, the next slide, please. Um, so you can see a little bit. Um, so for the implementation, students will complete assignments um, and it will be posted either in school or sent home with our younger students. Students will attend any virtual class meetings that teachers may have, um, depending on if it's individual, small group, or entire class. Um, but then the teachers will be expected to be available for students to ask questions or get extra support at some point in time throughout the day. So um, this is a day where our teachers will be available for kids, either via email or for a Google Meet session um, how, well, that through the office hours. Um, but the majority of our time is going to be for our teachers to be prepared um, in preparing and um, for the, the consistent changing dynamics that they have in their classroom. Um, and we feel like these this methodology will give us the best chance for our teachers to be on the top of their game, be able to respond to the changing dynamics with the individual students that we have in whatever scenario they're working in um, and so that we can continue to have school. Scott? Thank you, Greg. So board members, you've uh, endured a long presentation uh, with a lot of hopefully uh, what you consider to be well thought out plans based on information that we've gained since we started back in July. Uh, and so at this particular point in time, we'd like to offer you opportunity to ask questions, make comments, recommendations uh, before we move to hopefully a recommendation for a second semester approval. I have a question about the Wednesday remote learning day. Um, I know we looked at some of the expectations for teachers and for students. 
does that mean teachers are going to be in the classroom, in the building, or do they have the option to work from home? Um, I guess, how what does that day look like for them with regard to that? And um, I'm, I know you touched on this, but I want to make sure that having the remote Wednesday is not so much of a burden that they still don't end up with planning time, right? Like that, that's really the purpose of giving them this. So um, I just wanted to add that at the end. We have learned that some of our teachers, a high percentage of our teachers like to be in the school on those remote days because they like to have access to the equipment, to the materials that they have in their class. And so for those teachers who find that to be the best way to address their student needs and also be able to accomplish the things they need to, self-directed, as I think you're moving, that's your point here. We also have teachers uh, who would do that work at home. Uh, you know, and again, uh, we're trying to, to keep people distant from each other to some extent. There is some methodology here from a health perspective as well. Uh, teachers can collaborate. They do that now on uh, videos like we're, or Zooms and chats like we're conducting here this evening. Uh, but it will be a work day for staff and it will be at the location that uh, they deem appropriate to best meet the needs of their students and to be able to accomplish the things that they need to. Uh, because at the end of the day, they need to be fresh, they need to be prepared, and they need to be at their best for their students. So that's a good question because one of my thoughts as I was hearing this, and we've talked about this for a, on and off for a few weeks, so this this question did not come to mind before. but the teachers that have students in Forest Hills who will now have them home with them, are we just increasing their burden? And, and you know, how are we gonna do that? Because I know I've tried to work from home with my kids present and it's difficult. <laughs> so how, I'm gonna make a how shout do we out. do that? I'll, I'll, I'll make a, uh, a point of emphasis for our parents here. That would be similar to what they are dealing with on, a sim on the same day. And so the communication aspect and the consistency of it and the balance of, you know, everyone knowing in advance, hopefully provides opportunity for our teachers, for our, our, and our parents, the ability to be able to do some planning. Um, because you're right, that's a tough thing to do. When you're trying to engage in your work and you have the responsibility of managing your children, um, back to Leslie's question, there are many, many people in our community that work at home. So if our, if our teachers, when our teachers are doing this and they're managing their life and they're also having those office hours for kids and they're balancing their planning, I think that that's similar to what a parent might be doing who has a, a, a similar kind of home environment, um, professional responsibility during the day. So I think it would be similar to parents. I have, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one for for Mike. Uh, so, who when, when you say there's 14 periods or what are bells that need to be that are unfilled? What happens on those? Who fills those when we don't have the substitutes? So, for example, at uh, say Turpin High School, if you've got three teachers that are not covered, that's 15 periods in the day. So. <clears throat> Mr. Jones, who's absent, has first period class. You will look and find the teacher that has planning or is off that period, and you will ask them to sub for that teacher. So that's why I say if you have three teachers not covered, that's uh, five classes at 15 periods. You're probably looking at 15 different teachers throughout the day covering one period individually. So, And, and that's happening fairly regularly now. I would say certainly, yes. I would uh, say we've got two to three every day, yeah, since the numbers have picked up. Hey, Mike, where do paraprofessionals kick in? Where do, in other words, uh, do they sometimes cover classes? Yes, we, we do that. The, the other thing I will say is, um, we can have them cover classes. We, we're not expecting them to teach, right? 
but mm-hmm. we could have if a teach if a teacher is quarantined, if we can find uh, a sub, say a paraprofessional, to go into the classroom and then have the teacher that's quarantined teach virtually from their house into the kids, we have that set up as well. So yes, we do use the paraprofessionals. We use study hall monitors if we need to. We have, uh, if you remember, we have five permanent building subs at Nagel, Anderson, and Turpin. Then we have three Mm -hmm. at our elementaries. So if it's a good day, they're able to cover those those, uh, periods. But yeah, if we can use a paraprofessional, we will do that or a study hall monitor. So another thing, yeah, that kind of brings up the building substitutes. I will again commend the idea and the fact that we were able to do that, uh, that 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 came up. Um, you know, it's come up again and again. Why are we still open when when school districts that are very close to us are not open? Well, that's the difference. Is that we were able to get those building subs in in the summer, knowing that this was coming. Mm-hmm. And we're not, we're still scrambling. I mean, I, you know, I think now we would have liked to have 20 instead of six, but still, yeah, yep. but that's, that's been the difference as far as for Forest Hills versus even very similar districts close to us that just don't have the people that have had to go, that have been forced to go to remote from that, from that standpoint. Um, another quarantine question though, which, I mean, this, it, it's, I don't say it's a moving target, but it's very, interesting on how you know all of these go in that so when we have a you have a number there for for kids who are quarantined or or staff for that matter if they have a if there is a positive case in that family okay in that family unit which means by definition they all quarantine if say that's a a a mom that has it and she has four kids do those are they calling in under quarantine or are they calling for our absences? I, I know when it, you know, when it goes through the school and we quarantine people, we know that, but is that, is that something that, that shows up in our numbers here or do we just know that that's happening or, or what kind of happens there? So it's a great question. We found that the way that we have been marking students that are in that situation we had been using what had been there prior, but John Eckert worked with uh, our all of our buildings, and we've now got a designation for quarantine. So if a student calls in and says they're sick and they're quarantining, we've got um, a category that we have our attendance secretaries put that number into, and we've gone all the way back to the beginning of the year to code them that way. So in probably probably next week, sometime we'll have all those numbers. What we were finding is we were marking students absent that were quarantining and still doing work at home. So we wanted to use a different category. Um, so you're not necessarily marking them absent, but we know that they're quarant- in, under quarantine. I think that answers your question. Yeah. So if, if I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm playing this out because obviously 11,000 sure. a day, it's, I mean, these are things that we're going to have to be dealing with probably in the next couple of weeks. But if, uh, you know, if, if again, if a, if a parent comes home or tests positive, their kids are now in quarantine, but it doesn't go through John Eckert because the kids aren't, I mean, they aren't exposed at school. Is that, and then I guess, does the parent just call in and say, hey, that's, this is how it goes. And, and, and how, I, mean, I don't know, just how does that work? I mean, is that? If, yeah. So go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, you're exactly right, Dr. Heiss. What will happen is if a parent uh, notifies us and we will actually help uh, or- organize their quarantine, but the coding system that we have, you're right, it, that is never going to show up on our website because the, the student did not, the way I phrase it, the COVID did not touch the student under our care. Right. But we will now have a, a better coding system after working with the county, uh, ACC, and where we can pull those kids out much easier to have cleaner data, knowing that, you know, we may have, you know, 50 students quarantined um, by us as Forest Hills, 
but we also know we've got another 37 quarantined because of contacts with mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa. So the teachers can adequately, and the buildings can make the choices that we're talking about right now, how to best serve those students. So we will have, we do have good data on that. It's just not the data we're required to publish. So John, can you describe for the board also what we're starting to see with elementary students who maybe have a parent who's sick and the, it goes not 14 days, it could go as many as 24 days for that student to be out of the school. Can you talk about that a little bit, please? Definitely. Uh, the challenge uh, with the younger students uh, is they have to be cared for. So in a lot of these cases, and this is where we're finding where mom or dad comes in ill, positive COVID, and then so that causes their child to go into quarantine. The only problem is if mom and dad have any interaction with that child, that child's quarantine, their 14 day quarantine does not start until the end of the adult isolation. So that could generate the students not in school, in class for 10 days, then they start their 14 days and it becomes a 24 day quarantine. And the scariest piece of this is, and that we've had this happen a few times in the elementaries is halfway through the quarantine of the student another sibling becomes positive and the cycle starts all over again we have had a few cases where students have been out for over a month because of the cyclical nature of it it is more of a elementary phenomenon uh, than a middle school high school phenomenon because it's more practical if you have a sophomore in high school put them in their room quarantine them you know and stuff like that or they're more independent to where if the caretaker is the ill person uh, that they can function a little bit better but yes there is a process where and i do believe we'll see more of this as time goes on of 24-day quarantines and so then you can see the impact of the teacher who is trying to coordinate they engage with those children, make sure that the materials are prepared, help the parent who's going through a very difficult time health-wise as well as just stress-wise trying to deal with all of that in their family life. And, that, and that's, a, that's, a new, that's a new set of issues that our teachers are dealing with and it's becoming more and more, uh, it's happening more and more, I guess. And so we needed to consider all of that when we were talking about second semester. So and then, then the other one, question I had, which is, which you answered, which is, you know, people are people do ask, and it's a valid question. How are we staying open when there's so much out there and the transmission? That's you know, I, I didn't know that it was none, but I, definitely the overwhelming number of transmission appears to be coming from the outside, from the community. And when they get into school, even our the kids that know each other that have come down with it have outside interaction so we haven't seen the transmission in our schools and and you can argue or conjecture over why that is but we're just not seeing that so as far as the you know how to make it safe as possible that seems to be i mean we're, we're doing a, a, a decent job especially with the transmission we're seeing on the outside of schools is that a fair statement john Yes, I, I I would agree with that. It's any connections that we've seen have always been from an outside event where they shared a common outside event. So that's how we're determining that we don't have the internal spread. Um, the only part, oh, go ahead. No, you can go. I was just going to say I appreciate this presentation because, as we all know, people keep, uh, you know, emailing it or, or asking, you know, why aren't we going to go virtual? And I am absolutely thrilled with this plan. I didn't want to necessarily have to have a whole Wednesday off, you know, for a quarter, but I go, it's better than um, the al alternative, which is uh, virtual. So I, I go, I, I think we're doing a, a, the, a, actually a pretty good job, a very good job, and and planning for this 
executing it. We, we have lots of different hiccups, but we do seem to keep rolling with it. And just the detriment to our kids, I think, if we went full remote, we're, we're trying to avoid that at all costs. So I am pretty happy with this. I just, again, I still think this is a uh, partnership with our schools, our teachers, our students, and our parents. I mean, we got to do the best that we can to keep everybody um, as healthy as possible to keep school in session. You know, I know that um, the homecoming area and then also Halloween, um, you know, my girls are in, in, in high school, so I know that they had different high school kids had different events. And then you see the surge. Now, do I know that for a fact? No, but it, it would appear that way. So I go, we all have to take a, a responsibility. Um, but I am absolutely thrilled that we are in school to the best of our ability. I have no problem if we need to shut down one grade or one school temporarily and we just keep on, on going. I think, I mean, I think that's commendable. We are doing a fantastic job with that. The only other thing I could add is I go, you know, some, like my kids are at school and they're saying there's just a lot of kids not going. I hope those kids, it's difficult being remote, but they are uh, motivated. Their parents are motivating them to be engaged in the classroom. I mean, they, they have everything available to them. It's different than the, the elementary. I get that. But, um, you know, everyone has to take responsibility for their education. But all in all, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how things are going. Um, so I, I kind of will echo Patty. Um, I, for one, never thought that I would support a remote learning day. Um, the board has done a great job talking back and forth with Scott and, and everyone to figure this out. Um, I happen to be one of those people who's in a really tough spot because I'm an essential worker and I have three elementary children, one of whom's a kindergartner. So remote learning definitely is not ideal for him. So along those lines, um, well, what well, I was going to say, um, however, I changed my mind on this when I started to hear the testimonies of the teachers. So especially at the high school level, we're starting to have these classrooms that have um, it, you know, a group of students who are in person, you've got some who are in the um, virtual academy, and then you also have a group who are in quarantine. And so you have this adult teacher at the front of the classroom trying to cater to all of these different needs, which we have defined as a district is very important to us. Um, and they simply cannot answer the questions fast enough. When they shut down for the day, they need to respond to the students who had questions during the day. So that's really the personal side of things that we were talking about when we were saying teachers are getting fatigued. They are not only working through their planning period, they also have work to do afterwards to keep up with these students and make sure that everyone's staying on track. So that was really what tipped the scale for me. I heard a couple personal remarks on that that um, did not have any idea that they were going to influence <laughs> a decision like this, but it's real. And if you're really looking out for student education, you're going to be flexible in times like this. So along that line, uh, one of my questions was going to be, um, Greg, you made a comment about trying to make the Wednesdays as self-led as possible for the kids. Um, I know in last spring, it, it definitely wasn't. It, it was requiring a lot of hands-on. Are we planning on making it more, um, I don't know, like, when you used to go on vacation when when I was little, the teacher would send you with a packet of papers and you could complete them in the car when you were driving down. Is is it going to be along those lines or are we still going to require them to sit in front of a screen for three to four hours like it was before? What Can we talk a little bit about that? Yep, that's a great question uh, and I appreciate you asking that. So the, the beauty of having the Wednesdays is that um, the teachers are going to be with the students in a physical setting Monday and Tuesday mm -hmm. so that they can adequately prepare the kids for the work that they need to complete on Wednesdays, and then they can respond to that on Thursdays and Fridays. So what we experienced in the spring was a long-term, nine-week trying to navigate an environment we were not, we were not prepared for. This will be much more successful because our teachers 
um, a lot of times when they're planning, they're planning weeks at a time. They're planning for an entire week. They know from Monday to Friday, I, I need to get from A to Z. And so then the, the Wednesday just becomes a strategic planning for them that, that that's how the kids can work independently those days. But they have two days to prepare the kids for what they need to be doing on that day independently. So it should reduce the questions. It, it, could, it should reduce the amount of um, adult support that kids are going to need. But then it will also be more aligned with the current instruction that's going to take place. So it's not going to be a lost instructional day for our kids. They will, have, they will be um, expected to work. And our teachers will have the opportunity prior to them on Tuesdays, being, before they leave, the kids will have a clear understanding of the things that they need to complete. Great. Um, and then my final question that I can think of right now is <clears throat> um, another concern I have with this is special special education. Um, what is our plan for those students? I know we are going to be asked about this, so I might as well ask it here. <laughs> yeah, so so ours, and I'll take that question, but um, so uh, Betsy Ryan and her team um, are already having discussions um, with our interventions, they're, they're going to be having discussions if this is the direction we go with our intervention specialists um, and our families talking about individual student needs. Um, and they will, they will respond to that. Some, some of the schedules may need to shift here or there or how we're supporting kids with some of our related services might need to look different. But we've also shown we can deliver related services virtually. Um, that we are already doing that within our virtual academy. Um, so it's going to take, it, it'll be another layer of creative thinking in problem solving. And you, you mentioned, I think Patty mentioned that this is a partnership with, with our parents and with our teachers and w w all of us working together um, trying to, to help kids. And a little bit of flexibility is going to probably be needed, but we will, um, we'll get creative on how we can support some of the kids. And I, I don't anticipate, anticipate being a significant, um, a significant experience or, or detriment to students. I know that, um, again, our teams will be all over this and we'll begin communicating and determining uh, what that's going to look like. So I'm glad you brought it up. And it's something that there's not specific answers on at this point because we're not, we're not sure where the board is, right? So um, it's also going to come down to individual student needs and um, our teachers know the kids at this point in time so well, um, and that we will we'll be able to work through those. I also like to add that, that Greg had talked about before that consistency of having that subset of children interacting with their teachers every week, as opposed to a full remote, is is a, is essential. And what we learned about the needs of our our special students is that that engagement with the teacher and that engagement with the teacher and the parent and maintaining that circle a tight circle is significant for the development of the children and for their growth and performance and so um, again greg started at the beginning the whole idea is to maintain face to face that is our number one objective for all of the reasons and all the questions we're talking about now Scott, if I could just add one little thing, our, our classified staff would continue to work and what it allows us to do on that Wednesday is clean and sanitize even more thoroughly than, than what we have or hit, hit spots maybe uh, that, that need or require a little bit more attention. So our classified staff would still be uh, on board doing what they do to make sure that schools are running properly. My last comment. I I don't want to drag this out, but we talk a lot today about teachers and Mike brought that up. We've had a great relationship with our classified association. They have worked with us. They've worked with the board. They've done um, everything that they could possibly do. Our transportation department, phenomenal people doing everything they can, cafeteria, custodians, maintenance, office staff. You know, you can't teach if you don't have the support in place. And those individuals who work with our school district, they also have grabbed onto the rope and they're all pulling in the same direction and that direction is in the best interest of our students. So as we've talked a lot about teachers and instruction and maintaining the, the fidelity of what's happening in our classroom, 
that doesn't happen with all of those people who are, you know, helping um, and and contributing to uh, the system. And so I, I have to make sure that I mention that tonight because they are also soldiers that are out there on the front lines doing great work for our children. I had one I, last I question. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I just appreciate you saying that. I, I hope our classified staff knows the major one of the major reasons this has gone so well is because of the hard work they put in. And our our transportation department alone has has been hit with quarantines, and they're jumping in to help each other out. And so I'll, I'll echo the sentiments that Mr. Prebles had. They, they've done a fantastic job. Thanks, Mike. Patty. Um, kind of to follow up a little bit with Elizabeth's question on Wednesdays, like. Um, a lot of my the kids, my kids have a lot of their assignments on Schoology. It's assigned there. It has the deadline, the um, you know parameters, and all those kinds of things. But sometimes the uh, teachers are independent, right? And so it's not consistent sometimes. Um, because we're going to have Wednesdays always remote. Is there a way to make sure at least what the kids are seeing, where they're seeing their assignments, where they're seeing due dates? You know what I mean? And those kinds of things. Is there a way to start to make things a little bit more consistent? from their viewpoint. Yeah, I think that's um, that's what we're hoping with um, having this be just a continuation in the middle of the week, that we're hoping that, that um, the assignments that are posted, I mean, we're, we've promoted in our district the use of Schoology um, as the primary resource tool for grades two through 12. Um, and then we have um, other platforms for our pre-K to kindergarten students. We, for our, our kindergarten and first grade students, that we will send home materials. Um, we will, or K and one, we will send home materials with them. So the teachers will have the copies and things prepared when they go home. Um, but for our high school students, we should be posting in Schoology. Um, that's kind of what we've, we've committed to and advertised. Um, and that, that, that would be extremely important if we have to go to a long-term remote setting, especially um, you know, the use of Schoology in that consistent place. So, yep, it's something that we will, um, we will be communicating. All right, thank you. Uh, anything else, guys? Or do I have a motion to accept the second semester planning as presented. I make a motion to accept the second semester remote learning plan as presented. Second. 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 Okay, any other discussion? Mrs. Copper? Ms. Choice? Yes. Dr. Asmussen? Yes. Mrs. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Barber? Yes. Dr. Heights? Yes. Mr. Prebbles. Any other Dr. Heiss, uh, members of the board, um, as we've been looking at all of this and we've been contemplating uh, reviewing data after the Halloween break, uh, we saw um, in our schools and in our community uh, a spike. And Dr. Heiss, uh, said it best earlier, which was something like, you can argue one way or another, but in our schools, what we saw was something that took place at a higher level uh, after the Halloween break. Uh, and so as I take a look as a superintendent about this coming week, um, I think that there will be um, families participating in Thanksgiving at what level that is up to them. But I do think even in my own home, we have a son who came home from college, there's more interaction in our family than there was <clears throat> just last week. And so there's a possibility that uh, we may be experiencing something that we haven't in the past because we've opened up another person coming into our bubble, so to speak, our quarantine bubble. And so I think that the possibility of families uh, whose children are coming home or whatever that might be, may be engaged uh, a little bit more than what they currently are right now. And so um, with what we've seen again today in the state of Ohio, I'd like to recommend based on all that we've experienced 
after our Halloween break that the board consider approving for the last week of the first semester. That would be December 14 through 18. For that week to be a full remote learning week for all pre-K through 12 students in the district. And so uh, I think we've seen other local districts and I'm not going to say because they're doing it, we should. We have spent an hour and a half tonight talking about our remote decisions based upon our own data. So as I reflect on what our school district has gone through over the past uh, month or so, and then in the last couple of weeks with a uh, time when a lot of people engaged outside of schools, um, we're seeing a spike. And I think that's gonna happen again. I don't think it will, show up in our schools the very week after Thanksgiving and that's why I'm pushing that out because of the quarantine and the, the day the incubation period for the disease to travel through families and then people have symptoms so um, that's a recommendation discussion that I'd like to bring to the board's attention now we have talked about this before um, but there was no uh, expectation that a full presentation be arranged on behalf of the board in our community like the second semester. So I'd open that up and I also have asked Greg because that remote learning sequence would look a little different than what he talked about in second semester and we could discuss that with you now if you want Greg to go or, or you want to um, have commentary before that. That's it, Greg. There we go. Okay. Um, so to be just uh, to make sure that we're, since we don't have a formal presentation, just to make sure we're on the same uh, page, we're talking about the week of December 14th through the 18th. Um, and that would be a remote learning week for our students and staff. Um, that basically we will we will be ending the first semester remotely on the 18th. So um, that last week before break is again we we'll make sure we're talking about the same time frame. Um, but students will be required to participate in learning activities each day organized by our teachers. Um, we worked the entire summer um, on developing remote learning, full remote learning guardrails and expectations. We collaborated, we had teachers and teams of folks and administrators putting these together. Um, our high school, middle school, Nagel and both of our high schools have implemented um, and have done a lot of the work already around full remote learning. Our K to six students have not um, and our teachers have not. So. Um, those will, they will be employing our, our full remote guidance that will look different than it was in the spring. And I think some of the concern that we hear often is that um, the experience in the spring, albeit we did the best we could, um, could have, it, 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 with time planning and preparation, could have been better. Um, and that's where we are with the guardrails and what we've set up for this week. Um, and so it would be an expectation that our teachers are connecting with our students virtually. Um, students would be attending live, um, live instructional sessions um, with their classes. Um, K to six students would be completing, following um, basically their special schedule and participating in, in specials work as well. Um, but these are learning days for kids and we would basically be implementing our full remote plan for during this week. So it, um, it is much more robust. The expectations are higher for our kids and um, it's, it will be less um, just teachers providing assignments, but it would be more um, two-way collaborative communication. Um, the last thing I'll say with uh, before, and without getting into too many details, because there's, there's things that will need to be worked out, but our high school students, that is exam week at both of our high schools. Um, Monday and Tuesday are typical school days that would be utilized potentially more as review days for virtual review days. And then the, um, the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the um, 16th, 17th, and 18th are exams. Our students are on a shortened bell schedule that day anyway, um, and a shortened day so the students would still follow their exam schedule. Um, the students would participate in um, summative classroom experiences. 
Um, and that's kind of the way the language we're using at this point, that if this would be something that we implement um, over the next couple of weeks, we would, <clears throat> our teachers would have the opportunity to collaborate on, around what that might mean so that they have an accurate understanding of what student learning is for their classroom. So if they are giving a final exam and they want to give the final exam virtually, that would be an option. If it's a performance assessment, if it's a project, if it's a presentation, um, they would have the opportunity to have some level of a summative classroom experience for our kids. Um, the, the other thing that is interesting in this model is if we would go to this, is that we would be sending devices home with students. So um, at, especially from the K to six level. So our students are using devices each day. They would take the devices with them that they're using. Um, and then our kindergarten and first grade families, we would be sending a survey for you to determine if they need a device in the home and we would connect with parents. And we have a, the, nice, the, the nice thing about this is we have a little bit of time to prepare so we can get that information. So we would be giving parents and students um, all the resources and tools that they need throughout that week in order to be uh, to be successful. Um, so um, that's just a little bit about the expectations. Um, if this would move forward, um, our buildings would be having significant communication with our teachers and with our, our principals would, um, with our teachers and teams, and they would have opportunity to um, prepare and get organized for what that potential week would look like, so. Comments, questions? I mean, I'll just start. Uh, Scott, I think you brought it up last week in one of our calls. And for the high school, my kids are in high school. That is exam week, as you said. They are on a, an abbreviated uh, schedule anyways. That is the week right before a two week, you know, holiday um, break. So, um, you know, when we went through the discussion about second semester, you know, we started out with the teachers need like two hours, you know, every other Friday, and then maybe two hours every Friday, then we went to a full day. And I get it, I understand that they have uh, needs and that that was, in my, in my mind, that was um, offering that up to them. I do not see how giving them the week before two full weeks off is um, good. So I do not, uh, like that plan at all. Um, my thoughts aren't super organized, but I'm going to try to organize them quickly. Um, I'm, I'm kind of where Patty is in the sense that this is majorly disruptive. Um, and I think we would need to have a significant sh uptick in cases and showing spread significant to justify doing something like that. At the same time, part of the justification for it is it would really stink if a kid was exposed on that Friday right before you head into the long two week holiday and had to miss Christmas and New Year's in arguably the hardest year any of us have ever seen. So that's sort of the the flip side to the benefit to it, if you could pull it off. When, we, when, when you first called and we talked about it, I didn't realize it was exam week. So that definitely adds an education element that makes it a little more complicated. Um, I Personally, I really just wanna make a plea to this community to be safe, that we just explained that most of the spread happening is happening on our social time. So it is happening in the way we hang out on the weekends, it's happening in the people we have over to our houses, in the um, sports awards banquets where kids are up hugging each other and things like that. That's on us. That's, that's our part of the responsibility here in keeping the schools open. And so we can't have it both ways. We can't have in school all the time, in-person education and our happy-go-lucky social lives. We can't. I don't like that any more than you do. Um, so I just think that's the reality of what we're all looking at for the next month. I would say 
I would only support that kind of a, of a move if, if it's clearly evident we cannot make it work, that we cannot go to school that week. But I think that this community can do better. I, I think the quarantine numbers that we were just shown, they prove people are not being careful. Um, and, and I think we're better than that. So I, I hope that everyone hears tonight how serious it is that but the system is held together by very, very delicate pieces. And we have to do our part to help it hold itself up. Um, I have a question for John. Uh, would a week with 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 our students being out a week, do you think that might have a positive impact on slowing the spread a bit? Being as you know, most of the cases have come in from outside of our schools, as opposed to starting inside our schools. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry. I didn't realize my camera hasn't been on, but my internet's slow. So uh, my still shot's probably better in the case. But the the spread in and of itself, uh, obviously, it could go help reduce the spread within the within the facilities. But the biggest thing, though, too, and I think we sort of go into what Elizabeth was talking about is the amount of close contact quarantine. So if uh, you know a student does bring it in from the outside then we're, it's just not that one student, it's 20, 30, 40, 50 kids that are in, going to be impacted prior to those weeks. So that's, that's the big piece. Obviously, if we're not in, the, uh, the spread cannot come into us. But yes, I mean, eventually I'm going to say, and I'm you know, uh, not the epidemiologist either, but I'm playing one at work, that we are going to eventually, if we have large uptakes, we are going to start seeing some interconnectivity within the buildings of where we're causing that spread possibly, not causing it, but the spread is happening within the buildings. So a long way to say, yes, I do believe it can help uh, reduce the possibility of community spread. And, but I can definitely say it will definitely help the opportunity for students to be quarantined, less opportunity for students to be quarantined throughout the that time. So is this something we need to vote on, Morris? Well, it's something, I mean, it's it was brought up for discussion and that's and that's mm -hmm. what we're on. I think the um, you know, I think it's a, a real thing. I mean having been through a number of quarantines, uh, it's horrible. I mean it's just it's it's very tough it's not a great education process we're good we're a lot better than they were in march and april i mean I'll, I'll kudos there um but you know it takes you out i mean it takes you out of, off the off the grid for a while and and um and you know part of me thinks and, and kind of what from what i'm just you know i'm just kind of summarizing what i'm hearing here is that well you know we one of the things that we've done all through this is is we we're dealing with the data that we have in front of us and we're we're making decisions based off of that um the you know right now we don't know what the next couple of weeks are going to look like i'm not real positive that that week is going to be a great week for our our kids in that just because of what john was saying i don't think you know personally i feel very strongly that we're doing an awesome job in the schools and we are we are protecting our kids. We're protecting our staff, and what we're doing there, which is 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 something that is very difficult to do in society, is you know the mandates that we have, and it's working, which is great. But we all come home, okay? We all you know we all have weekends. We all have those things where there's spread, and that's what's happening. Is again, as, as John pointed out, you have a couple kids come in and test positive, a couple teachers test positive, then the, the it's not exponential growth, but it's 20 and 30 uh, kids per kid that has it just be, you know, and, and you throw in a couple sports teams or whatever. And that, that's where you get the 40 or 50, you go to one practice and it knocks out a whole team along with the kids that are around. So, um, so I think I'm just, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm kind of getting an idea that, that we, it's an idea, it's something that we're not necessarily 
thinking is 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 something we want to do at this the, the advantage or do at this point. The advantage of doing it right now is is to some of our other things is the planning part of it is like if if parents know, well, we've got you've got three weeks to figure it out, and our teachers have three weeks to figure it out. I have no doubt that through Greg and Scott and and uh, uh, Mike and and our team is making plans for an eventuality where we have we already are doing that. We have the hi the remote hybrid program where what happens if we shut down a school or shut down a grade? What happens in that time frame? So, um, you know, so I mean, to answer your question, Dee Dee is is yes. I mean, we can we can vote on this. I I'm. Uh, uh, you know, like some of the stuff that we've done uh, through Scott, you know, kind of get an idea of, of board direction on this is, is it something that we're, we want to do now or, or not? And, um, you know, that's, that's what we're discussing right now. Um, I just want to throw out some comments. I'm on quarantine right now because my daughter was a close contact at school. This is our second quarantine. The first one, we just, we traveled to Iowa, which is on the Ohio governor's list of do a quarantine. So we did the responsible thing, kept our kids home and, and quarantined and then got back in school and then this happened. Um, and it's hard. Uh, and I think back in August or July, it felt like so many of us were just, at opposite ends and it felt like it had to be all virtual or it had to be all face to face. And what I have appreciated and seen and, and just in my own evolution of how I feel about this is that it is not all or nothing, right? Like we can pivot here with this grade, we can pivot one building if we need to, like we did at Turpin um, in order to keep these kids in school face to face, which ultimately is the best thing for them, right? I think we're all on that same page. Um, I had the, I, I was concerned and had questions about this today. So I was able to connect with Greg this afternoon and he, you know, spent half an hour, maybe longer on the phone with me, walking me what a day would look like at the elementary schools at Nagel and at the high school. Um, and that did give me some comfort. Um, I don't know what the right thing is here right now. So I, you know, I am very interested to hear what everyone has to say about it. That's just my take on it. The, what it can do to other kids and pushing them into quarantine does make me nervous. And I'm also trying to be cognizant of the fact that that may be because I'm on my second quarantine. Um, and like Elizabeth, I have little kids, you know, who do require that attention. And just um, shout out to Meredith Lindsay at Maddox if she's watching, because she has been phenomenal um, in helping even me and my own like mental health of doing all of these things at once. And even, you know, dropping by our house to drop off materials and things. And what I have found out is that, you know, that's not uncommon. Teachers are really just going above and beyond to really help their kids. Um, and Again, I don't, you know, I'm starting I'm going to start to ramble and I don't want to, I, I, I don't know what the right thing to do is about this particular week. Hearing Greg walk me through each day earlier was helpful to me. Um, and I, I just really am concerned about what that's going to mean. I, I, Elizabeth is right, right? Our community can do better. Patty alluded to this earlier, you know where we need parents to take this seriously. We, we can't have it both ways, right? We gotta, we gotta wear the mask, we gotta distance, we gotta do all of that stuff so that we can keep doing this. Um, and I'm very, very nervous about the holiday and what that's gonna mean in the building. Um, so all of that to say, I have no idea other than I you know, have some real concerns. Um, on, on both sides of it, you know? So, um, we have 30 active student cases right now. 
there were 323 quarantines related to those cases. At Anderson High School today, when I talk, excuse me, Turpin High School today, when I talk with Mr. Spencer, there are 151 kids that are on quarantine. There are another 150 students who are not in that building because they don't want, for whatever reason, they are not coming to school on these two days. Uh, I think, in their defense, it has to do with their school is closed and they're fearful. And so I honor that and I respect the decisions the parents make regarding when their children do and do not attend school. They are parents. I am a parent and I, I get that. I want face-to-face -face learning. If I'm wrong, we wouldn't need the 14th through the 18th. If uh, my crystal ball that I'm using in my world based on everything that I see is right will be remote that week somewhere in several potential places. I am a avid, appreciative employee of this Board of Education. And if we are not ready to make this decision at this moment, I am perfectly fine with that, and I will continue to manage and address these issues as they come to me. I am hopeful that I am wrong. However, with what I'm looking at and what I see, I think that we're going to be in a position, potentially, where we're going to be doing this in a much swifter, shorter, unplanned time period for parents and families. And I know one other thing about my job. Parents like information. They like to be able to make decisions ahead of time. There are hundreds of schools in this state that have not attended a day of face-to-face, -face, and families have worked that out. And um, if we're not there, we're not there. And I can continue to move forward. And, and I, I'm not upset in any way. We are dealing with this together the best way we can. And we will continue to navigate the best way we can. So it's not a confrontational conversation. It is just what I said. It is a conversation. And collectively, we all are doing the best we can in a very difficult time period. The, the recommendation comes from me based on what I've seen. I want to be wrong. And so um, it's at the board's discretion, and um, I'm okay with that. I mean, that's what we do. We do. That's what all the calls are about. That's what all the conversations are about. And that's why these discussions are very important. And I'm glad that we're doing it because I think our community needs to see how this board wrestles with the very comprehensive school district that we operate, that we are entrusted to operate. So. I don't want this to be an uncomfortable position for any of us on here, and I certainly am, am uh, you know, ready to move forward with whatever the decision is, and we'll continue to work together. If the decision tonight is to move forward, I'm in. If the decision is to hang on a little bit, let's check some more data, I'm also in. And, and we'll go talk about the five-year forecast. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good. I've, go ahead. <laughs> The only thing I was going to say is, I mean, we have we have seen it happen when we had to do the the sixth grade at Wilson and also Turf. And I go, if we have to pivot, we will. And I think we have everything in place to do that. So, um, yep. I I, yeah. I just don't see making a, a definite move to do that if we have to based on the data because from Thanksgiving to that date we've got three weeks. So if there is an uptick, it almost looks like it's going to happen between that period of time then they're on break. I mean, I have no idea, but I just go, I think we have the tools in place and we're, we're plugging along. Yeah, and community, here's your heads up. We actually are considering that as an option. So, you know, there's there's been rumors swirling that we're trying to go full remote and hopefully anyone could hear this conversation tonight and it was abundantly clear that has never been on the table ever. 
as far as I know, um, and that this, what you just observed here, um, I, this is how we interact. And sometimes we do say, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't know right now. And that's really where we are with this. So I, I think that I hope people walk away from this as let's take this seriously. And the week that week being remote is not a threat, but that is something that the board very seriously needs to consider if things continue the way they are. All right, thank you. Um, let's we'll move on to item 6.1. Are we good with that? Well, good, a lot of, a lot of head shaking, that good. All right, so item 6.1, uh, this is uh, something that's always fun is the budget hearing and organizational meeting. Uh, we, we are required to do that, uh, I believe within the first 15 days of January. Um, it's a statutory requirement. Uh, it's usually a fairly quick meeting. Uh, we have tentatively scheduled that for January 8th at 7.30 a.m. Uh, in central office. Obviously all that will be subject to whatever, but on but the date and time um, is, uh, uh, is that acceptable to everyone? I believe that's a Friday morning. It's usually about a 10 minute meeting. Does that sound good? All right, can I get a motion to uh, approve the organizational meeting as shown. I'll make a motion to approve the budget hearing organizational meeting set for January 8, 2021 at 7.30 a.m. at Central Office. Second. Second. All right, Ms. Proper. Ms. Taylor. Yes. Mrs. Barber. Yes. Ms. Choice. I was muted. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Rasmussen. Yes. Dr. Heights. Yes. Uh, now, uh, item 6.2, board discussion. <sighs> board discussion. You want to speak? I did want to bring up one thing, and I, th I think sure. we addressed one, which was virtual. Um, like in school, so I think that was great. And then the other thing I kind of hear out there is there was some talk about we are, um, the board is meeting virtually and pe sometimes people didn't like that idea. Um, so I just wanted to address it and see if anyone else had any perspective on it um, as well. Um, but my perspective is, I mean, I, I, I like the virtual, but what I actually really like is the streaming of the, the meetings. That way I go, from what I know, we have exponential viewing since, since I guess, because it's never been done, right? So we were forced into it. I think we have a lot of parent engagement. And as far as I'm concerned, um, I think our meetings are, um, are supposed to be information, sharing with parents and disseminating uh, information and, and just kind of what we're doing. So I go, I think this is a fantastic thing. If we do it virtual or if we're in there and it's streamed, I go, this is a wonderful thing for us as a community. Uh, I am actually glad you brought that up because I think we should say that on this because um, we wrestled with what to do with this. Um, and by all means, this is the format we chose for that reason. There were people in and out of quarantines and it is incredibly difficult for a quarantine board member or staff to participate in the meeting if they're virtual, but everyone else is present. So the past few meetings that we've had that we've been wearing masks, it's really difficult to hear through the microphone and also transmit to the live stream on YouTube. We are discussing such intense detail oriented things at this particular meeting that this one makes sense. Um, so again, no decision making is very easy right now, but there were precipitating reasons for this one. Yeah, I'll just I'll just echo that what everyone said. I think the, you know, what, what didn't come out, and we don't, you know, is there's a number of people here that are on quarantine or are in isolation or both or uh, out of town, and and that is an advantage to have, to have it like this. And plus, and, and I I would I would anticipate uh, to Patty's point that in the future with our streaming capabilities will be better. You know, when we get past all of this and we have a, a an open meeting um, that 
that our sounds better and and I'll tell you the doing the last meeting virtually where I you know where I was coming through a phone in the center of a table was just this side of, of worthless so um, that's that's a challenge but uh, uh, you know, and again to Patty's point we have I think upwards of 550 people at this meeting um, today and it's important uh, to obviously all of our our parents and and our staff and and everybody about what we're we're discussing as far as second semester goes. So, um, this is this is a uh, a great way just for that informational standpoint. And that's what I found through all of our summer meetings is the feedback we were getting is I could hear you, I could see you, and and. Uh, and the presentations take up the whole screen as opposed to being a uh, uh, iPhone video of a screen that has something on it. So, um, so we're we're listening. I mean, that that the feedback that I got uh, was that uh, was that yeah, I couldn't hear you. The microphones weren't enough. Your you know your your masks are, are you're too far away and all of that. And on these meetings, the feedback I got is I can't believe you're not meeting in public. You know. You, you guys should all meet together and you know you're all hiding in your basement and which is which is fantastic especially for those of us who are in the hospital every day um but um anyway so uh yeah i, I hear you i think you know just like we're, we've talked about with our schools i think we'll do it on a on a case-by-case -case, uh basis that's how i plan to do it um as we go through if if it makes sense to to meet together i mean it's certainly nice to to, to be together. Um, uh, it's uh, this meeting, I think was a great meeting to have uh, on this format because for those reasons that we were able to get I, I, I think Adam can uh, can bring up how many it was but at one point it was 550 people that are watching us as we deliberate as we come up with these ideas in real time with decent uh, uh, volume and be able to see what we're going through. Um, I just wanted to bring up too, just kind of, uh, and in in my world too, we, we talk about uh, being safe and and things like that. It it is, you know, taking everything aside. There are issues that are coming up, and that's you know, in one of my hot out of my three hospital systems, we have one hospital that has closed down now. It's all COVID patients, totally full, stopped everything except for COVID. It's all COVID all the time. That's happened over two weeks. It went from we went from 30 patients to 155 patients. So, so these are you know these are all people that are sick enough to be hospitalized. Uh, Patty and I talked a little bit about that. It's uh, I found out more information. It's you're in the hospital generally for five to eight days, um, and those numbers keep stacking up. So it's 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 a challenge right now. And uh, you know I'm not one much one for being on a soapbox about being safe and all the things that we've heard about for nine months and we're so sick of. Um, I, I get all that, but uh, but it's it's affecting it's affecting healthcare now. And uh, it's yeah, it's I think we've got a, a couple rough months coming up. So um, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. But I, any anything else uh, from the board? Um, I just wanted to make one more follow up comment on the meeting format, because another criticism that we have heard from the virtual is the lack of public commentary. And so I just wanted to bring that up because in the past in person meetings that we've had the past few months, I don't know that we had one public comment. Um, and I just wanted to say in this format, you people can reach us anyway, anytime, you know, stop us in Kroger send an email, phone number, you know, phone calls, we, we will bring things to the rest of the group. And so, you know, it's great to be able to address us in person. Nothing really duplicates that, but in the, in the absence of that, you know, say we were to all be under stay at home order again, we are accessible. We, we want to hear from you. We had thousands of emails earlier this year. Um, so yeah, I would just say, please exercise that format as it's needed. Obviously, the board can speak for itself, and it is doing that. Every single place I go has a different format right now, everywhere. And so for our board to act appropriately and have a discussion like it's had tonight that's televised in the open and visibly seen by multitude of people that generally would not see it, 
the board's doing good work. Um, and we'll be back, hopefully, sooner than later, and it will all go back to normal. Um, but for now, it's different, and it will be for a little bit longer, um, and we'll move forward. So I just hope people can understand that everything is different right now, and we are a little bit different ourselves, but we'll be back. All right, so uh, nothing brings the online viewership numbers down more than the human resources report. I'm <laughs> Glad to be of service. Uh, <laughs> I, I emailed the uh, human resources report to the board and uh, I hope we answered all the questions you had, so I'll be brief. I do wanna recognize Dr. Heiss was discussing uh, healthcare and a group that I have failed to mention that I need to make sure I mention our health aides and our school nurses have been unbelievable. They are the ones that are taking the temperatures of the kiddos and they are the ones that are doing our contact tracing. Uh, John Eckert, I'm sure would echo that sentiment. So I wanna make sure I say thank you to those nine individuals because they have done just a tremendous job. So thank you. So under human resources, uh, the only item that I will point out is item A, because I believe it's worthy of pointing it out. We have a retirement of a Turpin High School English teacher who has taught for 32 years, and that is John Polivka. We want to say congratulations to John Polivka. John has been the English department head at Turpin High School as well. Uh, his wife, Kathy, retired last year, and I believe I know his, his students went through Turpin, so the Plifka family has had an unbelievably positive effect on the culture at Turpin High School, and we wish John nothing but success and happiness in his retirement and say thank you for everything he has done for Forest Hill School District and Turpin. So congratulations, John. With that, the only other item I will mention is we do have a increase of FTEs to 779.36 from uh, last month, October 26, that is due to an increase. It's a good increase because we found bus drivers of FTEs that we could not fill. So we have uh, additional bus drivers due to uh, some retirements and resignations. We have had a difficult time filling those and we have filled those. So with that, the superintendent recommends that the board approve the personnel items as listed. All right, any questions for Mike? This will be part of our consent agenda. So we'll go on to the treasurer report, uh, item 8.1, modified tax budget resolution, 2021-22. Okay, the first two items on the treasurer's agenda uh, concern our next fiscal year. So our fiscal year that begins July 1, uh, 2021, is tax budget. The purpose of the annual tax budget is to demonstrate need for and use of the taxes that are collected um, by our district. Item one is a resolution. And again, it's requested by the Hamilton County Budget Commission. This resolution permits the district to file a modified pass, uh, tax budget for the upcoming fiscal year. The modified tax budget continues to present information for all those funds that receive taxes, and it eliminates the requirement to present those funds that do not receive tax re revenues. On the modified budget, the district reports our five-year forecast and appropriations for debt service, permanent improvement, and building funds. I, agenda item 8.2 is the calendar that outlines the requirements and the timelines of the higher revised code to um, present and pass the tax budget. As you can see by the calendar in your agenda, we will be asking you to approve the tax budget at the organizational meeting that you just set on January 8th. And prior to that, as required by code, the um, tax budget will be available in our office for public viewing. We will also um, make sure that we get it on the website due to um, the current day and age uh, of the coronavirus. Um, a notice also will be placed in the December 4th edition of the Cincinnati Inquirer as required um, by the statute. And after the board's approval, the tax budget will be filed in the auditor's office prior to the January 20th deadline. Item 8.3 recommends the approval of the excess workers' compensation insurance contract with Meadowbrook Insurance Company for $34,776 brokered through um, Barry Insurance Group. 
Uh, before we brought this to you tonight, we obtained quotes from a couple of companies, and this is also a change from our current company um, who bid 11% higher than the, the quote that we're suggesting you approve this evening. The next item on the agenda is everyone's current uh, pres favorite presentation, five-year forecast. Um, always a fun time of the year. Um, we take a look at slide one, you see the, I, I always like to give concept to what, what part of the budget that we're talking about. So as you see there, the uh, general fund, that is the fund that is on the five-year forecast. And this year we have a budget of 88.6 million in our general fund. And um, that accounts for 82% of the total budget. So as you look down through there, I just wanna present the other types of funds that you see we have, the building fund, um, state and federal grants, and so on that actually support, that also support all of our programs. We could move on to the next slide, please. I always like to remind you that the five-year forecast is a planning tool. It's simply a snapshot of today's financials that's adjusted to reflect everything we know about the future. It takes a look at past trends and, it equal, and, that, and that is how we prepare the future um, uh, projections. It, it is a living document. So once new information comes along, we do change it. And this has been quite a year of new information coming along every week. As we prepare the forecast, we need to make assumptions about future revenues and expenditures. And we base those on past trends. Making those assumptions can be pretty challenging and I've um, put a list here of, of um, some of the challenges that we run into when we prepare the five-year forecast. The first two alone, the state foundation and the property valuations and collections that we have no control over, those two items alone um, comprise 97% of our revenues. And this year we've added, you see this chart every year, just to remind you of the challenges that we go through um, in preparing the forecast. And as you can see in red there, we've added a new challenge. The pandemic has certainly been challenging as we take a look at our forecast. As you can see from looking at the list, there are material challenges that impact every line of the forecast. Okay, go to next slide, please. The last time we looked at our forecast was on September 17th. And I wanted to present this slide to show you the difference in the ending balance, the ending cash balance from at June 30, uh, 2021, from when we last looked at it in September to the forecast that we're presenting tonight. So if you look at the bottom two lines of this, of this chart, um, you will see that on fiscal year 2021, um, our ending cash balance increased by 9,000. But when you look at the ending cash balance in 2024, you will see that the ending cash balance is tracking practically the same as our previous forecast. So the increased cash balance at the end of our current fiscal year is really the result of a timing difference in the collection of property taxes. We are simply collecting the property taxes earlier than we have expected. So if we take a look at the next slide, it kind of gives the detail to, to what those changes um, entail. If you look at this slide about the um, third row down, you're gonna see that um, property taxes, uh, we typically have a collection rate of 99.5%. So our delinquency is only about 5% of our collection. Due to the pandemic, we forecasted that the collection rate would go down by 1% this year, and then down by 2% the following year. And then as you see in uh, 2023, as the economy starts to recover from the pandemic, we forecasted that we would uh, collect those property taxes because property taxes are always collected one way or the other. So it's simply a timing change uh, within our forecast. So you could say it was quite the surprise when that downturn did not happen. Our full um, tax collection rate was 100.4%. 
So not only did our rate not go, so not only did the collection rate not go down, it went up. So again, one of the challenges of forecasting. So um, when you look at that, when you look at our five-year forecast, um, we've talked with the state forecasting experts, with the tax experts, and and um, they do not believe that this downturn is going to happen. Um, tax revenues are coming in fairly strong. So we have um, changed the timing of our tax collection, and that's what makes the changes in the um, cash balance that you saw in the previous slide. Next slide, please. This is the actual forecast um, with the cash balance moving into the projected year. If you look at the revenues presented by the blue bar, you can see that they're growing at a slower pace than the expenditures, which are represented by the black bar. Expenditures grow with inflation, and of course, property taxes do not. The green line represents the effect on the cash balance for the lack of revenue growing with inflation. This chart clearly in indicates that uh, spending patterns cannot continue without a new revenue source past fiscal year 23, as 24, fiscal year 24 would end the year with a negative cash balance. In the next few slides, we're gonna take a closer look at the data that goes into these three lines. When I see the chart on my screen, it's missing some of one of the, um, it should have another pie chart under the fiscal year 2020. Does everyone see two, two charts there? Is that just the my screen that's somehow dropping it? It's blank. Okay, it's dropping in. Okay. There were some what numbers was, missing on the previous slide too. Yeah, I thought so too. Is it, I don't know what's causing that because it's on the PowerPoint. <laughs> kind of weird. Um, hmm. This shows fiscal year 2021. Is that what you want, Alana? Actually, there are two part pie charts on this slide and I don't know why it's broadcasting just one. So, okay. Would it would it be better if I brought it up on my own screen? Okay. Sorry, board, for the change here, and uh. Take me just a minute to get it up. You see the PowerPoint on this your screen now. Would it be better if I didn't run? Okay.
So there you can see the previous slide that was missing the years. One of the things that I wanted to make sure you could see both on this slide, because I think it's 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 really a, a, an important uh, point that is happening um, to our revenues and, and um, something that's very concerning. This chart in particular shows how the district's funding burden, burden has continued to shift away from the state and to our residential taxpayers. In fiscal year 19, our residents funded 64% of our general fund budget. In 2021, this year, that financial burden has grown to 70% of our general fund. And that 70% comes directly from our residents, either in the form of tax payments or through TIF payments. As you can see, um, the difference in state, only 27% of our tax revenues are coming from the state this year, as opposed to 32% that came from the state last year. And this is directly a result of the 1.6 million in state reductions that we saw for both last year and this year. So as we look at our forecast, I just wanted to make sure that, that this was an important point to to um, put that the, the uh, funding burden is very definitely shifting as we go through this pandemic. So when we look at our property taxes, what drives tax revenues? The valuation of the district and also the tax rate. In our district, um, taxes are paid mainly by residents. 88% of our property evaluation is residential property. That only leaves 12% to be composed of business properties and public utilities. In addition to that, there's a misconception that as property values increase, the district receives additional money. This is not true. House Bill 920, which was passed in 1976, freezes tax revenues at the time the levy is passed. We get no inflationary increases as our property evaluations rise with inflation. Exceptions to House Bill 920 are, of course, inside millage and new construction. But both of those rise at significantly less rate than inflation. And that's why the district must return to the voters from time to time again to, for new levies. So what is our current residential tax rate? It's 43. Uh, two, three. Um, there are 12 schools out of the 22 schools in Hamilton County that have a higher tax rate than Forest Hills. And as you can see, our uh, residential tax rate is also um, 3.24 mils lower uh, than the average here in Hamilton County. So 27% of our revenues come from the state. Um, state revenues, 17% um, of our revenues is, and state funding is actually presented in two different lines or three different lines on it. Two of the lines have to do with um, school foundation. They make up 20.4% uh, uh, of our budget. And the property tax allocation that comes directly from the state makes up 6.6%. Property tax allocation is a tax credit, which is paid to the homeowners uh, from the state. That tax credit was um, uh, uh, done away with by House Bill 64. So what that means in prior levies, uh, prior levies were less expensive than the current levy. A new levy will cost $35 per mill. Prior levies cost 32.5 due to the um, rebates by the state. So that's a quick look at revenues to turn around and say, what do we spend our uh, general fund money on? Where does every dollar go? 62 cents of every dollar goes towards personnel. 23 cents of every dollar goes to benefits. 
purchase services gets 10 cents out of every dollar, two cents of every dollar spent on supplies, and a penny and a half is respectively is spent on capital outlay and debt service and another penny and a half just on other um, miscellaneous items. So the uh, fiscal year, the five-year forecast, fiscal year 2020, um, does include the staffing reductions due to attrition and the um, higher resigned personnel and the amount of 646,000 uh, that we announced uh, last May. And of course, as we go forward, our salary projections are always based upon negotiated agreements and past market trends. Uh, benefit projections are currently in line with our current benefit package. I think a lot of people may not realize that fixed costs also represent a large amount of our budget. 7.3% of our budget are fixed charges, such as student tuition charges, which are directly um, deducted from our school foundation payment in the amount of 2.6 million utilities district-wide. Um, take another 1.45 million out of our budget. Property, workers' comp insurance, and settlements takes 865,000 from our budget. Um, county fees and audit fees, most people don't realize that the county charges us to collect property taxes. Uh, the county charges us around 570,000 to collect um, our property taxes alone. When you add in um, audit fees and uh, um, Claremont County uh, Educational Service Center fees, that amount rises to about 680,000. The general fund supports debt service in the amount of 462,000. Um, that debt service is due to bus purchase and um, uh, operations center purchase. And the district spends about 400,000 annually on fuel. So what does that mean? Less than 8% of our general fund budget is really discre discretionary spending. Less than 8% remains to be spent on materials and supplies, professional development, and care and upkeep of our buildings. I think that when you take a step back and take a look at our district and take a look at our, our finances, I think our residents will see that they do get a good return on their investment here in Forest Hills. Our financials win the state auditor award of distinction every year. Um, we spend less per pupil than the average Hamilton County School District. And as you saw earlier here in the presentation, our tax rate is lower than the um, Hamilton County average. Both of our high schools are ranked in the top 50 in US News and World Report uh, top high schools in Ohio. And we are amongst the top 10% in performance on the state um, report card. So that was kind of, you've had a long night. That was kind of a quick run through on the five-year forecast. I know that we have uh, spent a lot of time talking about it um over the past few months but i want to give you the um, opportunity to ask any questions that you might have at this point i mean i'll start i mean we had our finance meeting on friday um we kind of did go through a lot of stuff and i thought it was it was beneficial to, to start to dig in and um, everyone knows we are running out of cash so we kind of talked about um, the projection. What did the district offer in services and education? How much debt we have? How much uh, permanent improvement do we need in order to keep everything going? And um, I mean, Elizabeth, you were with me at, at that meeting and I go, I mean, it is overwhelming. Um, we talked about we do actually have to deal with this. Um, and so we never got around to what are the next steps in order to deal with it, but as a board, um, so what's going to happen if we don't deal with it, then we're going to get at the end and then it's going to be the same thing. It's an emergency. We're going to have to cut X number of things if we don't pass it. So 
you know, I've, I've really tried to, to be proactive and go, how do we get ahead of this? How do we identify all these things? How do we involve our community? Because I don't believe we just keep asking for more money. There has to be uh, a lot of brainstorming and a lot of options and then going to the public and going, this is where we are. I think we have to be, a, we present a real situation of where we are and where do we need to, where do we want to go as a community? What will this community support? If you want it, you have to pay for it. If you don't want to pay for it, then we do have to make changes. But um, we, we are needing to do that. How do we want to address that as a board? Like timing wise, um, and, and, and organization wise. Um, so, yeah, it was, I, I think I commented that that was one of the most um, productive committee meetings I've ever been a part of. We, we talked through a lot of difficult things. It was two hours. The fortunate and unfortunate thing about where we are right now is that numbers speak for themselves. <laughs> and there's, there's nowhere left to go when you are where we are. Um, we used to have a board policy that we shouldn't let the cash balance dip below 10 million. And not only are we there this year, it will continue to go. So this was, I mean, we did know that we were going to be here. And so now as a board, um, this, this group of people does have to face this. We need to have serious discussions about how we move forward and keeping the community up to date on, okay, if we keep everything we have right now, which is the nine beautiful buildings that we just renovated and all the programs that we love and the teachers and the administrators. If we really want to hold on to that, this is what it's going to cost every year to do it. Here's why we don't have that ongoing. Things have changed in the whole world. Look what just happened. Um, and then we put that out there. Um, I, I suggested at the end of that meeting, um, the township does a comprehensive planning process every five years. I think it's every five years. But they have this group that comes in. It walks them through. Here are the resources you have. Here's what's available to the township in terms of property, in terms of businesses, in terms of demographics. And it puts it all together, and it helps inform the township on what they are going to do. And I was a part of the process a couple years ago. It's starting again now for the next um, couple years. But the district needs to operate that way. We need to make database decisions. And so that was something I was going to suggest as we move ahead is this board, you know, I know all of our backgrounds. None of us are experts in community planning, district planning. I think we're going to need help with this. And it needs to be with the goal of a sustainable model. The model that we have now was always going to struggle with sustainability. Um, it was. And we've, we've pieced it together. We had it limping through until COVID hit. And now we have to face it. So, you know, Forrest, I don't know what this looks like in terms of how we as a board start to talk through this and give the administration direction. But we do have to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where we are now. That's the... The, I mean, the sustainability and, and is, is by the very nature of the way school finance is, is unsustainable. It just is. And it's, we get to a point where we, you know, to, to your point, Elizabeth, is, the, uh, is, is what the community is willing to support. To Patty's point, we look at, uh, we, we look at things and we, we're always trying to, to be as efficient as possible, but when the model states that there are no increases for inflation, unless you are in a deflationary model, which in the past 50 years has happened one year out of those 50 years. And ironically, then people said, I wish my property taxes should go down, right? I mean, what, what do you mean? I'm paying more that, that one year. And I quickly said to everyone, that would be great. Go ahead and tell, you know, Get it back to the property, you know, get it back. I'll give you this year, if next year it goes up 20%, your taxes go up 20%, then we're not having that conversation. So um, to 
So, so there's there's an an inherent di difficulty is that state funding the way it, the way it works is that the you know now that doesn't mean that we still don't look for all of the things that we look for, and we bring it to the community about what you know what they're willing to pay for and when and how and and there, it's a checks and balances and over the course of of the last three decades we've we've had that we've had runs and we've we've had every once in a while we'll get a windfall from the state i don't you know this usually in the past 15 years it's been a not that it's been a oh, 1.6 million out of your budget that we've already approved times two so so those are things that i mean you know that's this is the start of that conversation and that that's you know it's it's a real thing now as far as uh you know, we, we talk about a three-year promise, and, and we're still on that, but the problem with the uh, three-year levy is that basically a year into it, you have to start thinking about the next levy. I mean, that's, but the problem with a six-year levy is it's a 11 mil ask that nobody's going to pass. So, you know, some of it is is strategy as far as dealing within the system, and then there's, there's, question you know bigger questions on doing things you know outside the box or those type things which is is a struggle when you're held to a foundation payment you know when she was going over the things it wasn't that long ago when we were in high school it was 60 percent of our funds were coming from the state and our local property tax is only 30 percent or even 20 percent and now that's flipped on the head and not changing anytime soon so um the you know the planning that you know and I'll just get my little dig in for for demographers. I am a big not fan of those. Okay, and that if uh, I've looked, I looked whatever five years ago, and if you followed uh, the the demographers. Now this isn't the whole planning that you're talking about, which I think is more comprehensive. Um, this is you know in 1987 we should have built four more schools because we would be at 12,000 by mid 95s. But then two years later, we, we, we should have closed four schools because we were going to, you know, at this point, we would have been at 4,000. So they're so, I mean, to make planning decisions, whereas in actually, in actuality, the last 15 years, we've been plus or minus 100 kids from 7,500, uh, you know, just like that over the course of, of, of a long time. So, um, but on the other hand, you know, something like that where we have a, a more comprehensive plan I, I certainly has some merit. Yeah, and what's neat about the way that they do it, so they kind of project and talk about, hey, we're going to go after uh, ap building apartment complexes, and we are going to work on empty nester housing. So that's all in a plan for the township. So that helps the school district anticipate the load from apartments, and you know they plan to build X, Y, Z amount of um, of building of um, neighborhoods, and we've increased the way that we communicate with them a lot. And, and I think we are in step a lot more, but we see knowing that people are attracted to Anderson Township in such a large part by the schools. It's in our best interest to coordinate these plans moving forward with that. You know, the community clearly said they love the nine building system. They need to understand that that costs like that costs. It, what it, it, they need to understand what exactly it costs to, to maintain it. They might very well say, "Oh, well, sure, <laughs> we'll pay for that," but they might not. So you know, that's just where we are, and and it's a great place to be. I, I, I it does feel overwhelming. I agree with you, Patty. But at the same time, in education, you're not going to cut things unless you have to. We, this is kids we're talking about. We, None of the programs we have right now are fluff. We have them because we believe that they're important to the kids and to the community. So we wouldn't proactively cut those. We are at the place now where we have to decide, will we pay for them or will we you know, move forward with a different model? And I'm not saying cut because there are ways to do things efficiently to conserve resources. That sounded like a politician, but that's not how I meant it to come across. <laughs> As we go through this process, I mean, you talked about having a consultant. I talked about having a financial consultant 
you know, because I, I think that this board would benefit from someone who is not, who, who is a, a, not a debt consultant, but a f finance type of consultant that has no ties to the district, that is just objective when they make, hey, this is my recommendation. I think we, we strongly need that. The other part, the reason I'm overwhelmed is we talked about the operations, how much that is. We got talked about the um, permanent improvement fund, the capital expenditures, things like that. We are struggling to have money to just pay for the upkeep of buildings, roofs. I mean, serious stuff. The thing is this, the 103 did not cover it. We we have a significant balance of things that have to still get done. So we don't have that money. Um, it's the, the nine buildings. I mean, that's why if you go look at other communities, they don't build independent buildings. They big, build big, big um, schools that house K to 12 or some version of that. And the reason is it's not just um, efficient in, in building, but it's also efficient in the, in the school, in the education, meaning if you've got a, a child that needs special attention, you can move them within the buildings to get the right teacher, the right resources within that same building. If you have someone that's, um, you know, is, is, is ahead of the game, you can move them up in class. You can do a lot of things to um, help your child do the best learning because you're in the same building. I mean, Mike, you've brought this up quite a few times. If you're in one small building, you can't, you're not moving kids around. You're not moving teachers around. They are stuck in that building with the resources that are there. So there's many, many different um, benefits to not maintaining the nine buildings. Of course, we're stuck with it for the time being because we've put so much money into it. But that's, you know, worth a conversation in 15 years. Is this where we want to stay? That determines the types of things that you're spending currently. Um, but... We, we, we don't have enough money for a permanent improvement. We have debt and we're, we're struggling just to operate. We're running out of cash. Um, I don't think that a levy is the total solution. I understand from, from time to time, you have to do that to gain revenue, but um, I, I'm, I want to see what else that we can do, seriously. All right. Well, why don't we? Uh, I, mean, I don't know what what uh, resources are available, but but I will uh, task Atlanta here to uh, because a, a finance, you know, a, as we've all found out as we started this job as board members, is school finance is different than pretty much every other finance. It's a different, you know, public funding and government is different than private uh, uh, entities, but uh, but. There, I, I have to think that there are people, just like school law is different than general law, so um, that there are specialists that are in that that uh, would be worthwhile to uh, for all of us to to get a perspective on um, on where we are. Um, you know, I will say that I think our our the, our finance office and our you know does a a very good job as far as keeping things together and, and coming up with ideas. And I know we've done that within our, our district for years. That's why we are for all of the, that last slide of all the good, the good places that we are, and especially in, in comparison to uh, like districts, we are ahead of all of them. Doesn't mean we can't get better, but on the other hand, you know, that, that's a testament to uh, what's been done in the past. But um, but yeah, but moving forward, I think that, you know, getting a better grasp, it is, it is overwhelming when you have an $89 million budget and, and a, there's a lot of moving pieces. So um, I think that would be helpful. So uh, anything else? It is getting, getting, getting late, but um, any other discussion on this point on the five-year forecast or any questions for Alana? Okay, next. Uh, Item 8.5. Do 
You're, you're muted now. I actually checked to see if I was actually talking. Alana? There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, speaking of Anderson Township, the next item on the treasurer's agenda is a resolution approving the award of a community reimbursement area agreement um, between Hamilton County Board of Commissioners and Vantage Anderson LLC. The board previously approved the CRA in concept at our meeting um, last November 2019. This project includes um, constructing two four-story multifamily residential buildings, which will have uh, 224 rental housing units over a three-story parking garage and also a waiting uh, facility, a pike, uh, park and ride for Metro. Um, this is CRA is uh, scheduled to be 15 years, uh, 75%. The next item on the treasurer's agenda, um, 8.6A er, would be donations, which over the past month totaled just over 2,500. Item B is the statement of board accounts, which presents all fund activity for our current fiscal year through October 31st, 2020. Item C presents the general fund, um, our five-year forecast receipts for the month, um, and the fiscal year to date ended October 31st. October was a moderate cash flow month as we expected. During the month, we received two different biennial payments. We received our fall TIF collections from Anderson Township of just over 6 million. And we also received the fall distribution from the state of Ohio for the homestead and rollback that rebate of property taxes that we talked about just a few minutes ago. And that was in the amount of 2.8 million. At this point in the year, revenues are tracking, tracking as expected and as just presented in the five-year forecast. Items D and E present the expenditures in the general fund for the month and the fiscal year to date. As always, expenditures in the general fund are stable and they are spent evenly uh, throughout the year. So with 33% of our fiscal year complete, we have spent 31% of our appropriations and we have another 6.9% committed for future expenditures. So again, appropriations are tracking where would we would expect at this point in our fiscal year. The October 31st bank reconciliations and investments are presented in agenda items um, uh, 8.6 F and G and the Anderson High School logo rebranding fund detail is presented in item H. Agenda item I requests, requests the closure of a mass student activity account at Anderson High School due to inactivity. I respectfully request that the board approve the items 8.1A through 8.6I. So moved. Oh, just a quick comment, I guess, on the uh, community reinvestment area, the TIF one. Yes. I originally thought it was we were held harmless, but you made a correction and said no. So it is a 15 year tax abatement. Yeah. Well, Patty, Sorry. Patty, Patty well, hold on one second. Just oh. can I, we'll get a second and then we'll discuss because oh, I'm with okay. you. I have questions on that too. So we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Now, go, Patty. Okay. Yep. Just the uh, tip just, arrange. The tip right. arrangement was not in a. It's not a home hold harmless um, abatement, but the. Uh, I'm not necessarily against it. The, just my concern is. If you have too many families that move in that have school-aged children, that would be a detriment to us. It's not designed for that. However, that is a possibility. You know what I mean? That's my only comment for that particular arrangement. Yeah, I'll say I, I absolutely share that concern. And, and I we brought it up when we talked about it in the past or when we went over this and, you know, saying, hey, it's it's. You know, they, how many, Alana, do you have the numbers on how many, like two and three and four bedroom places there are? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the breakdown of the, it's 224 units, but uh, I don't have, 
here the uh, breakdown on the size of the apartments. Well, one of the things that we talked about, because this is, I mean, this is a, uh, a real difference than what we usually have. So, you know, TIF is, is a difficult thing to sort through, even in the best of times. Now, generally what happens, though, is for TIFs is that the, the township benefits, and I'm, and I'm fine with that, but almost always we're held harmless. So they have to get our approval in order to do it because I believe that gives them a 20 or 30 year instead of a, a more limited if, if we agree to it. And generally we do because the tax money that we have coming in is gonna be the same whether, um, whether we approve it or not approve it, it'll still be the same tax money. And if it's better for the township, then we do that. And we've done that many times. This is different in that we're not being held harmless. We are arguably being harmed by this, uh, meaning that we would not get the same tax revenue for the time frame, which is what, Alana? Is it 30 years? Uh, 15. Okay, so 15 years. For yeah, 15 is... years, we mm -hmm. would not get the same, the tax revenue that we would normally get. Now, when we talked about this, if it's a, if it's a, uh, a memory care center, okay, if it's the New England Club, you know, there's a, you can argue, and I, and I have in the past at these meetings that, well, what that does is that gets the people out of their four bedroom houses and, and, uh, or, you know, gets them, moves them out of Summit and moves them into, um, into that area so that a new family can come in. So even though it's a retirement home or something like that, there's still the potential for an increase in, uh, in having school aged kids. This is a little bit different. While they tell us that it is marketed toward the empty nesters, well, again, those are people now moving from, you know, you, we, we can name whatever neighborhood we want, you know, Ayers or, or uh, uh, Sunny Acres or, um, or Washington Woods, and they're moving now into that area, which opens up a nice three or four bedroom house for a young family to move into. Um, I expected, I'll say, I, I expected a little bit more input from them selling, a, uh, selling us on this concept before now, okay? I mean, we talked about this in November. Mm -hmm. A little bit of, some things have happened since November in the world, <laughs> okay? Yes, and so, so now coming, and we just talked about how we don't have cash, we don't have, you know, and, and here we have a situation where we are accepting less tax money, potentially where there's going to be more people moving in, potentially we're gonna have more student services that we need to provide for less money in a, t in a time where we're operating at more of a deficit. Now, the argument was back then, and again, I, I don't know if anybody else has had, I have not had any interaction with this since November of last year. I mean, nothing. So, which is somewhat annoying um, that that's, I mean, just because they're asking something for, you know, if, if someone's negotiating with me, I, they, I need them to at least, you know, call or, or, you know, we give them time here to say why this is a great deal. I haven't heard that. Okay, I heard, hey, just let's let go through so that the process can continue to go, and we'll we'll sort through that over the. Well, it's been a year now. Now I know we've all had other things on our plate. I get that, but I don't. I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm opening this up, and I'm opening this up to you know to Scott, and Mike, and, and Atlanta too. I mean, anyone who has any other information, I, I personally am am not real excited about this project um, as it stands for those, those are my concerns. I mean, our concern is, is the district right here and it has potential for not being good for the district. Yeah, I was surprised when it popped up again, just in, it was, it was different. Like some things changed about it and we, we weren't really briefed on it. So I have the same caution that you both have. We just need more information. Um, I do know that the original plan, I believe, was only for one to two bedrooms. It definitely was not going to be that conducive to families. 
but a lot has changed. So I'm not even sure if that's still the plan. So we do need to understand that before we make a call on it. Definitely. Okay, any, any, I mean, is that any other discussion or concerns that we have? How do we do that? Do we just pass on it and say, well, hey, well, can we have well, a, well, well we, yeah. we're still within the 45 day period for our next meeting on the 14th. Um, I can uh, pull this and get some more information. I too was surprised, like you said, it's been a while since we heard about it. And remember when we talked about it last fall, it was actually the Hills development. So um, now they've um, renamed it um, Vantage Anderson. So it took me a while to, to um, figure out exactly what it was talking about when it came in the mail. Um, but I can, um, it says that the project Anderson Township is anticipating considering this project at their December 17th meeting. Um, so if you'd like, um, in the information that is currently in board docs, you have um, the financial impacts that they are, um, the financial impacts on taxes that they are projecting. Um, that's within the packet that you have. Um, I hear what, um, Another question, we want to go back and reconfirm the size of the units. Um, so we want to know if there are one, two, or three bedrooms. Um, any other information we would want for our last meeting? Or, I reaffirm who their target market is again. Okay. I mean, I think if, if, if it was what the original one was, I mean, they were, these were luxury apartments, I think it would be fantastic for the township it didn't lend itself to a lot of school aged children, but I almost feel like it has changed. The conditions have changed. So yeah, if we right. could have somebody had, explain their target market, right? Right. And we, had, you, we had, and we had asked them too about saying, Hey, it's, it's what if, how about putting something in there that if there is a hundred kids that come in, that that changes or that there is some, you know, there's some uh, variation on that so that, you know, I mean, my point it was is if if you are 100 percent sure it's going to be empty nesters, then put your money where your mouth is and say, OK, I guarantee it. And if I don't, if I'm wrong, well, then I pay you back. And now, again, I don't know. I don't know if that's a thing, if that's even a possibility, but it seems like it makes sense to me to say if you are. You know, if you because the way they presented it is all oh, this is absolutely that is not going to hurt the district at all. And you're going to get an extra money than you wouldn't you wouldn't have got. And of course, it, it's always put if you don't say yes, then this thing is going to go nowhere. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Really? I mean, if it's that good of an idea, I mean, you know, and, and I don't I don't mind them asking for it, too. But it's up to us to decide whether it makes a sense, sense for the district. And and I just didn't see, you know, to Elizabeth's point, I mean, I. There's been nothing since that November meeting where we, you know, nothing to, except for some changes that they didn't notify us about until until we got this thing. So I Our, guess the question, yes. Um, it, you know, we probably need to talk with the township trustees because they were big on this. And so I think we need to have a conversation with them. Yeah, no, I think that's. Yeah, no, at a minimum. I mean, that's mm -hmm. so. So the the question is 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 Alana, and this is more procedural. Do we vote this down, or we do we just pull it from the uh, the agenda, or do we? I'm sorry, do we do do we vote on it, uh, up or down, <laughs> or, or, do, uh, or do we pull it from the agenda? You know, at this point, you're with. They have to give us uh, 45 days written notice, and the letter is um, actually dated November 3rd. Of course, we didn't get it to a few days after that. So we were are within that 45 day window if you vote on it at your um, December 14th um, meeting. Okay. So, so, so what, what will, how about I do this and, and tell me if this is, is procedurally correct. We will vote, do, should we vote to defer this to the December meeting? Um, yes, that would be appropriate. 
Okay, so do I have a motion to, to take item 8.5 and defer to our December meeting? I will make a motion to defer 8.5 resolution approving the, uh, the award of the Community Reinvestment Area Agreement between the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners and Vantage Anderson LLC until the December 14th board meeting. We have a second? Second. All right, uh, Ms. Cropper? Mrs. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Barber? Yes. Ms. Choice? Yes. Dr. Rasmussen? Yes. Dr. Heights? Yes. Now can I get a motion for items uh, to approve as presented item 7.1 to 8.6 exclusive of 8.5? I'll make a motion we approve consent agenda item 7.1 to 8.6 excluding 8.5. Can I get a second? Second. All right, Ms. Any other discussion? Ms. Cropper? Ms. Choice? Up, you're muted. Muted. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mrs. Barber? Yes. Dr. Rasmussen? Yes. Mrs. Taylor? Yes. Dr. Heights? Yes. So, Dr. Heiss, may I ask a question at this point? Yes, please. Um, now, now that that has happened, and there's been uh, a few questions along the way, uh, how do you and I, well, how does the board propose that we have this discussion regarding the details? December 17th is, that's like tomorrow. Um, and our next board meeting is December 14. Yeah. So really, we're on our schedule because we would need to do something so that they would be moving forward on December 17th. So we're we're on a quicker turnaround than the December 17th. Right. We're on the December 14th schedule. So we'll have to uh, we'll have to at least. I mean, well, one thing that that. You know, some of the, the questions I think are reasonable to ask even you know tomorrow um, as far as you know saying hey, I mean they can watch this tomorrow and say hey we need to we need to get this our act together here and answer the questions that we've posed so far and 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 then I don't know we could do it we could have on our you know we have the Monday meeting or one o'clock meeting that we can at least, bring that up um i know this is not going to be a popular thing among the people that want this done but on the other hand you know i don't i don't feel comfortable as as far as a, a district representative approving this so um and then and then yeah as we get more information we may have a, a another you know meeting before the 14th um regarding this whether you know we, we probably i imagine would do it like this with uh, with representatives from the township and the developer um, so that that I'd like all of us, I mean, as best we can to be there so we can answer those questions. That yeah, I mean, that it's just due diligence at the place and time that we are. There are several of these developments that are either in progress now or planned in the next five years. And we, we just showed the five year forecast. We clearly cannot be adding and adding and adding people without adding the resources. So everyone's going to understand that. We, we, would, we would not be doing our jobs if we didn't uncover all the facts here. So, all right. Okay. Maybe we move on to our reports to the Board of Education, item 9.1, the Anderson Township Economic Development Committee report. Well, that is a perfect segue. Um, <laughs> for the reason it's important for the Board of Education to be a part of the Economic Development Committee, um, because typically we will hear, Scott and I go to these meetings, and typically we will hear as this development is moving along, that's how we stay in touch for how these things relate to the school district. And this has been such a different year. Um, I didn't attend a couple meetings, and then the last one that I went to was all focused on Homerama coming up. We meet again tomorrow. 
So if it was discussed in the last our meets our meetings are every other month. So if it happened in the last four months, I could have missed it. And I don't know if Scott heard it or not. Um, so I don't have any updates for that committee because we meet tomorrow, but most of it's focused on Homerama right now. They're still working on the sky top apartment complex development. So nothing new to report there though. Those, those are things, I mean, that's, Large apartment complexes are significant for us. So I know that there's uh, some movement at Skytop um, with the Metropolitan Holdings Company that has interest in that property, and they have interest in um, a large complex with uh, a high percentage of one bedroom. Um, apartments there. Uh, the the nature of the attractiveness of that is for young professionals to be in that portion of Anderson Township and have access to the city and have access to the trail and, and some other things in that particular area. Um, and so that's another one that right now is being uh, discussed. And there's movement there. Um, and so we'll need to that's part of the economic development committee meeting. Uh, but I think that uh, the township is getting very close to striking an arrangement. Um, when I say that, I mean a, a, a collaboration to try to do something at, at Skytop. So, yeah, so, I, and that's obviously something that would impact us as, as young professionals also make babies. So. You're the doctor. I uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I've been <laughs> first second. So, okay. And I will tell you, I haven't had time to review it, but I noticed at six o'clock tonight, I got an email from the village of Newtown, who's also looking for some um, tax incentive um, movement on part of the board. So, it looks like over the next forty-five days, we've got quite a few uh, tax incentives to to review. Okay. All right, uh, finance committee report. So we did meet on Friday and we kind of talked about a lot of this stuff um, earlier. You saw the five-year forecast, we went through some of that. We have the deficit, um, we do need to address it. We talked about a combination levy, operating and permanent improvement. We have significant needs on our permanent, permanent improvement. Um, identifying them and then getting them funded and actually being able to execute them in a timely manner. Um, we talked about trying to hire maybe a contractor for district projections, maybe a financial consultant to guide the board on making financial decisions. Um, We talked about the permanent print fund, the CARES Funding Act, we, this one very briefly, Seven Hills Church starting at Anderson. We started to collect the rental fees on that. Um, they are moving in all accounts. They are just a fantastic organization and they have been very generous to us as a school district and they're putting, uh, starting to put in um, the equipment that they um, agreed to put in to be able to use the facilities I think in February. And they're just involved with our teachers um, providing, I guess, I think they provided um, some meal or coffee or something at the school. I think they're very involved um, with our district already. Um, and I did talk to Chris Newton and, and Rob Fellows about the Anderson fundraising um, committee today to just kind of um, make sure we're all on the same page regarding the funding and, and what does that really mean? So they're still trying to figure out, um, I guess they're, they already have their goal and idea, but they're trying to, I guess, flesh out everything else. Um, but again, the, the big thing is we, we really have to look at our budget and figure out what you said, sustainable. How are we gonna do this ongoing? That's it. All right, thank you. 
Uh, I have 9.3 Forest Hills Foundation report. I guess uh, Didi's not here. Or D, <laughs> not Didi is here. Um, nothing. We're just, you know, continuing the same stuff. Not a whole lot to report. All right. Um, item 9.4 Human Resources report. Well, we have not met. Okay. Uh, legislative liaison report. Uh, I'll just, the most exciting things that happened were, this is, this is the state of our legislator. So the Cup Patterson, which is now, Atlanta, I don't know which one, 380, or the, the fair funding for schools, which has been worked on for Scott, how long? Two years. Okay, so. So two years, three three years. So three years it's been worked on and it still hasn't been voted on. The Ed Choice program was a bill was created and passed in 24 hours. 24 hours. They included 122 schools that have been ranked A, B, or C in the last uh, uh, report card. So you actually have schools that are A rated that qualify for siphoning off money to, for vouchers to to schools that are, for the most part, less successful than the schools that they come from. So anyway, so that that has not been signed yet, um, but that passed on. That was created on Thursday and passed on Friday. The Fair Funding Act is still awaiting. I mean, there's there's things going on. There's public comment. You know, the Ed Choice didn't have public comment, didn't have notice, didn't have anything. It got, just got passed. The fair funding has been worked on for three years. Uh, there's been millions of meetings. There's still ongoing on that. But but there is, there is some, I, I don't know, Scott probably knows better than I do about, you know, there's some push to try and get things done. I mean, I, I don't want to put it down too much. It's still in progress, but not the uh, House met. We've testified uh, for two straight weeks. The Senate has picked it up. The Senate has heard uh, finance and distribution uh, testimony on December 2nd or December 3rd. I will travel back to Columbus on behalf of this board and the edge and uh, other schools in the state to try to get the Senate to approve the substitute House Bill 305 and accept that as a funding model for the state of Ohio. As you just said, Dr. Heiss, along the way, our new um, president of the Senate, Huffman, uh, brought some new language to the table. Ed Choice rapidly moved that through. Uh, Mr. Broadwater and I spoke about this at length today uh, about the disappointment that we have regarding that and how this new legislation that has identified several new schools might not be as targeted towards those economically disadvantaged and uh, low performing students uh, in districts where schools are not uh, performing at the level as we would hope. And it appears that it is a very crafty way to redistribute dollars uh, for choice uh, that is not necessarily what the spirit of this legislation, what the spirit of the choice was about. Uh, and so uh, obviously I need to be very careful about my commentary because I don't want to have an argument in Forest Hills and be um, plucked out by folks in the state who have very high ranking positions, but I'm very disappointed that school choice is moving in a way that in my opinion is not the reason why it was developed. It is a redistribution of funds going to, well, that's a good enough for now. Uh, very, very disappointed in this movement. Well, and I think, I mean, when I was reading through, I'm just disappointed. Any You'd like to think any good idea could sustain the light of day. So <laughs> if it's a great idea, have a public company, you know, tell us that it's a great idea. And and heck, if you think about all the things that we've been through, 
it's amazing how a first idea, when you get more opinions on it, actually becomes a better idea with more input. So something that, you know, there are very few bills that go through and just are created and passed because they can always be made better, even if you're a, a supporter of it. It, it. You know, you can go through, and that's what happened the last time when they, you know, it was a very quick thing, and 1,400 schools got thrown into it. So, um, but anyway, so that's that's my le legislative legal report. So, um, next up, policy committee report. Ms. Barber? Um, <clears throat> uh, we met last week, and we only had two quick review policies that were NEOLA recommendations, basically rewordings of how you can spend federal grants. Nothing okay. new. Pretty exciting. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have to vote on that? Is there anything to vote on or is this the first reading? First reading. The first reading. Okay, so we'll, uh, safety committee uh, report. We have not met uh, teaching and learning committee. We have that, Leslie. Sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, no, we haven't met since our last meeting. Okay. Uh, technology and facilities. Yeah, we met last month. Um, we went over that, and now, at long last, our Forest Hills Teacher Association report. I saw Donna yes. patch on here at some point. Good evening. So, on behalf of the association, uh, one of our plans tonight, which I've heard. Uh, Mr. Prebles and Dr. High speak of uh, pretty intently tonight is we had two things for you. One is our legislative update on our by FHTA as well as just some COVID um, updates on the staffing and some of things that are happening within that area. So I was gonna have Chris Preston this evening, our delegate speak, but Chris has gotta be in class tomorrow morning. So I wanna make sure he gets plenty of rest. Tomorrow's a tough day on teachers. So if you're still on board watching, uh, everybody give us a hand. It's always a fun day, but can be a little wild to say the least. So with that, uh, Chris has written his comments and I'm gonna kind of paraphrase those tonight for you. So he's kind of spoken that his FHTA delegate to the Ohio Education Association and also in Southwest Ohio. So Chris this past weekend was part of our Southwest Ohio where we have about, mm, be close to 300 or 400 uh, staff people throughout this region and school districts and so forth that are involved and they work on legislative items as well as do trainings and so forth so Chris attended that and then there'll be seven of us that attend virtually the Ohio Education Association Res uh, Representative Assembly on December 5th so there'll be seven executive team members who will be part of that. And part of that legislative work there is to really work on several of the items that you've already spoken of. And I did smile, Dr. Heiss and uh, Mr. Prebles, when you talk about how quickly that ed choice went through, when I think about the work that's going on for the other areas. So Chris's comments are based on his first is the bipartisan Ohio House Bill 239, known as Testing Reduction Act. And I know I mentioned this to you last month as well that this is something I'm very passionate about, that we are looking out for all students, all public students in the state of Ohio. And right now where that one is, it's uh, in May, it went with a 78 to 14 vote, but the bill would not reduce end of course assessments requiring districts to form a work group to evaluate the amount of time students spend on testing and prohibit student retention under the third grade reading guarantee for the 2021 school year. That's really of interest to us as FHTA, as many of our teachers currently we are very blessed here in Forest Hills to have reading specialists in our school districts. And a lot of those people right now are being allocated in different ways uh, to help with subbing and so forth. So one of the things that we focus on here is helping our students, helping students re, you know, perform well, and as well as with reading. When you have students who are virtual and students in person, some of those things can be very difficult. Uh, so one of the things here is to help not only our own students, but then looking at the schools, as you mentioned earlier, there are students in Ohio who still have not been in person. During my state OEA meeting last week, um, we were at about 34% of many schools where kids that still have not seen a teacher or in classroom. There are virtual obviously happening, but those uh, effects and creating those relationships and giving the extra support to students is a huge outcome on testing. 
So with us, what we've done here as well is we continue to communicate with our staff in ways which they can directly um, get involved with House Bill 239, and we're working directly on that one. The second one is the bipartisan one, which Scott has been very involved in, and you mentioned again, uh, Dr. Heiss, is the Fair School Funding Program. And that also we see House Bill 305 and Senate Bill 367, and talking about the capacities within those and the needs within schools. And those of us who have been involved in school finances and so forth know that the need of learning to be able to uh, get fair school funding throughout the state is so needed here in Ohio. And uh, we're behind that as well, uh, lobbying, but as well as also uh, creating opportunities for staff to get involved and to communicate more effectively. Secondly, um, I wanna thank tonight, uh, Assistant Superintendent Greg Sears and Assistant Superintendent Mike Broadwater for their presentations this evening and the work that's going on every day in central office with many of us, but also all of our principals, assistant principals, our staff, our faculty, bus drivers, everybody, just as we've all said. And I also wanna make sure that I reiterate our support for Superintendent Scott Krebels tonight. This is not a difficult time to be here. And as board members, I'm sure none of you signed up believing that this was gonna be the role that you would be in. And Alana, I know tonight as you make your comments as well, from me personally, following the finances and following all the things that are happening are very difficult for us. But I also think it's time for us to make sure that uh, Dr. Heist, that from the board, it would mean a lot to, to the staff is that we do have people. I mean, when Scott talked about 40 COVID cases and you know, as a medical uh, individual that those are real. And we've had some people who have family members who are very ill. We're very fortunate, extremely fortunate that we have not had someone pass from this. Um, but we have families who are strained. We've had family members who have lost family members or relatives. And so I think during this time, we need to make sure that we're very passionate about extending our, you know, our feelings towards those people and as they're coming to work and coming back to work and dealing with all the day to day that we're passionate about making sure we express our empathy towards those families. I also am very appreciative of understanding that Forest Hills is done face to face. We did a pause and reflect. I know in July I talked about a pause and reflect to slow us down to get us to that spot and you allowed as a board us to do a transitional time. That, that was extensive to the teachers, to the families, to be able to help students. If you, you know, Mrs. Choice, I commend her and anyone we've been in and out of buildings, but just to listen to trying to help elementary children to be able to keep masks on, to helping our high school teachers who are just doing crazy work. But the other part that's been very difficult, and I think, uh, you know, Greg did a great job and, and all of the administrators are saying it, but learning to do what we're doing day in and day out, it's tough work. I had one teacher say to me just recently, he goes, one of the hardest things about my day every day is just trying to figure out who's gonna be there. You know, you don't know what that's gonna look like. Looking into second semester to allow that, it's not a day off, it is definitely a work day to allow us to reconnect and keep those relationships with students and to help our staff members be able to take that pause moment to breathe regain and move forward. Uh, Assistant Superintendent Broadwater tonight talking about the subbing. That is, you know, a very difficult thing when you come in at 7, 10 in the morning and you stop at 2.40 and the only thing you've done all day is try to sneak in a 23 minute bite and maybe go to the bathroom. Our staff are in front of people nonstop. So we definitely know that when they're subbing, it's a big strain on many of them. And, and tonight I wanna to make sure that I tell you that giving that opportunity in the second semester is really gonna give them the opportunity to reconnect, stay connected and move forward with the academic you know, items that are needed. During the next few weeks, and I know the discussion, I wanna support Mr. Prebles and his request and discussion, because I think that we also have teachers and staff members who are looking forward to try to spend time with their families. I know many, many people on the, our side are saying, there's no Thanksgiving. 
there was no way to go to Thanksgiving. I'm too exposed. I've had teachers explaining to me that they've been turned away at the doctor's office because they're too exposed. They tell them to wait in their cars and so forth. So during the next few weeks, I totally respect the board's discussion on that topic, but I'd ask you also to make sure that you know from the staff here and from all of us, all of us are very, very dedicated to the work that's in front of us. Um, and that in place helps us to be able to move forward into second semester, but also that we have people here that are, you know, looking for ways to stay safe and to continue to be safe for themselves and their own families. So thank you. It's been a long night, but I think it's one of your shorter ones sometimes, if I recall correctly over the years. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. There is no executive session tonight. Our next regular uh, meeting of the Board of Education, as noted earlier, will be on December 14th, 2020. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Make a, make a motion, motion to adjourn. <laughs> I want everyone. Yeah, right. we're right. excited about it. So, uh, Patty made the motion. Uh, can I get a second? Second. All right, Ms. Cropper. Mrs. Taylor. Yes. Ms. Joyce. Yes. Mrs. Barber. Yes. Dr. Asmussen. Yes. Dr. Heights. Yes. Have a very happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Good night, all. Bye.